Well, well, well. Good afternoon. It is 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on a Thursday. So you know what that means. It's March 28th, 2024 of the Common Era. I'm joined, as always, by my illustrious producer, AJ. How are you, my friend? I'm doing good. March 28th also means it is a very special day for my uncle, uh, who is now a year older. So happy birthday, Zio. Uh, Ah, is this the uncle that you thrashed at fantasy hockey? No. Um, okay. No, but uh, he's the uncle that's thrashed me on a, a couple ah. of channels. Not, not in fantasy hockey, but just for being me. <laughs> I see. I see. I getcha. Well, it's nice to have you here, as always. Yep. We got a heck of a show lined up. We're going to be doing a Q&A. A uh, very question-heavy episode today. Uh, the NHL world right now is a little bit quiet, but we have a little bit of stuff to go over from that. Um, but before we get into the show today, let's do our quick first ad read of the show. Uh, we're brought to you by Fanatics. You can use our affiliate link below, or you can scan the QR code in the chat window to provide a small kickback to the show. You're, we're also brought to you by Puck Preps Hockey, where you can get all your NCAA and CHL prospect needs. The OHL draft lottery just occurred uh, with the Windsor Spitfires coming out on top. So be sure to check out Puck Preps, pick up a subscription. Uh, we got some very, very smart people and Jordan Millette covering the OHL over there. Uh, so you can check that out. There's lots of good stuff over there. Um, you can also help us out at Fractal Hockey Consulting, which is my business for hand track targeted player analysis and recruitment packages for the NCAA Europe and beyond. And of course, if you're a U sports player or know a U sports player or coach a team or a division three team in the NCAA, or maybe even a division one team, and you're looking for opportunities over in Europe, uh, we are putting together the golden bucket tournament. Uh, so you can get in touch with me, uh, or, or fractal hockey in general, and we will help you get set up with the golden bucket tournament. And of course, we're brought to you by scouting.ca where you can get exclusive access to innovative data tools with unparalleled insights into NHL draft prospects and players making their way into the NHL and lots of other fun stuff going on in there. Uh, so you can check it out at scoaching.ca. So today we're going to be, uh, someone asked about uh, Scott Wheeler's rankings on Monday night and we just didn't have enough time to get to it. Uh, and Craig Button dropped a new list literally an hour ago or so. So we're going to quickly go through those uh, after our first little segment here. And then we're going to talk about some games uh, of the week in the NHL that we have been watching and we'll be watching over the next couple of days uh, that are pretty important at this time of the year. And then of course, we're going to just fire off a bunch of chat questions. There's a ton that came in before the show so thank you very much to everyone who did that uh we'll get to as many as we possibly can and of course if you have any questions you can drop it in the chat as well but first we're going to start with uh something that we usually end the first segment of the show with the first hour of the show with, which is AJ's what aj's one a day <laughs> that's your name now uh aj's one day scouting extravaganza uh absolutely so where where the producer who dabbles in the world of the draft and will be dabbling more and more digs into a very brief look at a couple of guys in the in the draft. So this week, uh, we took a look at a few, I would say, polarizing, maybe, guys. I don't know. Maybe Possible. not. It's, it, one, one of them, it seems like I'm the only one not polarized, or that is polarized. But anyway, well, let's let's get started with uh, with maybe the, the less interesting discussion I think we could have, which is Consta Helenius. Okay. So you took a look at Consta Helenius. So take it away. What, what was your read on the guy? He just looked like a good Liga player who was pretty much better than a lot of the guys out there, just smarter. As you've said a lot of times, like he pulled off some things that I'm not sure he'd be able to pull off in, in the NHL. <laughs> One, uh, in, in the game that I was watching, there's a defenseman just waiting behind the net for a line change, and Hellenius just came up to him, stripped him of the puck, threw it in front, and it was a goal because that's the way the Liga goes sometimes. So he looked better than a lot of the guys there. But my my feeling was, okay, so what's he going to do in the NHL? Because I don't see a tremendously high-end guy there. I was thinking more like 3C, but I, I don't know. Like, he's fine. He's a smart boy. But Liga hockey's weird and not very intense. And he seems to be a more intense player than a lot of the guys there. And I wonder... How is he going to handle even more pressure and more intensity when he gets to the NHL? So that's kind of the way I lean there. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's that's generally how I've seen a lot of him a lot of the time. I, you know, if this is a draft where, um, if this is a draft where, smarts you know if you're if you're a draft person who like loves really smart players i feel like i could see why he's sort of up near the top 
definitely just kind of gets it, reads the ice well, anticipates stuff well. Um, but yeah, like, I, you know, the data that I've got on him is very, I'd say, okay in, in a lot of different ways. But, you know, again, like he's not a bad player at yeah. all. Like when I when I'm when I'm a little more skeptical on him than a lot of people, I, it's not that I don't like him. It's just that I think he and I think you said this earlier, but I think he's maybe a third line guy in the NHL, maybe second line on a, on a like as a winger or something, um, you know, just a pass first off puck heavy guy who is smart and just knows how to move the puck. Um other than that, I I, yeah. I I don't know, right? He like uh, he wasn't that great at defense, from what I saw. Like he tried, right. definitely tried, but he wasn't really doing a whole lot to stop things from happening. Yeah, in the offensive zone, he was doing okay. Like he was doing decent. And same thing with transition. Like he looked better than a lot of the guys in transition. But Liga transitions kind of eh, shoddy, as we've seen with the the flying V formation that. Uh, the <laughs> Pelicans implemented with Dude, Brad Lambert. I have seen two other teams do it multiple times oh, this season. No. It's I don't know what it that's all about. Um or sorry, the five man breakout, but it's like yeah, it's basically a flying V. The the wall of the wall of death. But I mean I've seen it work a couple of times and it's kind of interesting when it does work, but it just Liga. doesn't work it a lot. Work anyway. it yeah, it doesn't work like at all, leagues. really. Yeah, it's it's kind of hilarious. It's constant hilarious. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh but yeah, I mean I, again, like I don't mind Hellenius if a bunch of te- guy if a bunch of scouts on my team were pounding the table for him and it was like 11th overall in this year's draft, I guess I will not complain, but if I'm right, I will not forget. If Alpha because phrase there, I'm complaining. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like there I think I, again and it, this is like it's not that I don't like Hellenius. It's just that there's a lot of guys that I think are sort of on his level or like comparable or somewhat more projectable. Cause I, I don't know. I think with Finland, it's sort of its own animal watching those, watching that league, right? Like the, the, the quality of, of player is very, very wide there. I find like some guys at the top look pretty darn good for that level. And you know, whatever, but some guys when they're at the bottom end of that league, like like what you saw with Hellenius, like bad play like that and and just sloppiness. It's it's there's a lot of it. And if you're smart enough to make a read and capitalize on it, you can get away with a lot. And so with Hellenius, it's like, what is he gonna be, right? Like I think third line is reasonable, yeah. especially with how smart he is. But yeah, I, I just see top ten everywhere, even top like seven everywhere, and I'm just thinking that that might be a little bit a little bit yeah. much and for I'm, me. I'm willing to bet on the brain if if you can yes. get him to be faster and you can get him to work on his skills a bit more. Cause I saw him try and dangle the pants off of a goaltender. Like he basically had an open net and he wasn't able to do anything with yeah. it. Cause he did dangle him out, but he just kind of got like tripped up on his own move. Yeah. Like I, I, I when I look at Hellenius too, it's if we're talking about players at the very, very, very high end of the draft, it's like, what does this player do better than everybody else? Right. Like with Hellenius, is it his shot? I don't think so. No. Is it his pat? Is it his playmaking ability? I don't think no. so. Is it his physicality? No. Is it his ability to carry the puck? I don't think so. Is it his defensive play in his own end? I don't think so. It's like the reason he's kind of up that high is like he might be one of the smarter players in the draft, I would say. Like he's up there. But I also think that there's a lot of players in this draft who are really, really smart and deficient in a lot of ways like they don't have the best shot they don't have the the speed they don't have the evasiveness they don't have you know the physical intensity they don't have this they don't have that but they're really really smart so it's like how much does it separate a guy like Hellenius from these other players um who are also very intelligent and seem to really get it but just don't really show the same sort of uh output that that Hellenius does. So in any case, I don't know. I I, I don't mind him, and I'm cu- I'm I'm interested. I was interested to hear your thoughts, but yeah, uh, I think the more the same alley as yours for the most part. Yeah, yeah. Like I have Hellenius in the twenties, I think now, like early mid twenties or something. And sure. Uh, but the more interesting one, I think, where we could have a little bit more of a discussion. Mm-hmm. You took a look at uh, the big giant tree trunk of a man in uh, Anton <laughs> Salayev. 
Uh, Anton Salayev got the AJ treatment this week, so give me the rundown on him because I want to know. I want to know. I want to know. I want to know real bad. I watched the uh, like the elimination game uh, for him with his team in the KHL playoffs, and he looked great for two full periods. Like he was, he was making good defensive plays. Like he was basically stopping everything that came into the, his own end for a lot, like a lot of the game. And like he'd apply pressure to guys and they'd lose pucks. Like he looked great. And then I got to the third period and he still looked pretty good, but there were times where he held onto the puck too long and like just turn was a turnover machine and it caused his own team to be stuck in their own end for an extended period of time. For the most part, I really liked what I saw. It's just that was the big issue. But right. he gets around the ice pretty well, especially in a high pressure situation like I watched. Like he was doing well. He looked great for most of the game. Had a pretty like had some decent pass attempts too that generated some good offensive chances but yeah just wasn't great with uh at, towards the end of the game where he's over handling the puck and kind of shooting himself right. in the foot and putting him in himself into more trouble but I, but i like i looked at your list after i watched the game I, i'm like okay so where does will have levshinov in comparison to salayev and i was surprised that you have him a whole tier ahead because i like salayev better i so yeah i mean I, Again, Salayev is kind of a weird one for me, where if you really value him and really believe in the idea of let's just draft this guy and see where he's at in five years, like because we think he could be really something, I can't really disagree with that because I can see that, right? Like there's just to me with Salayev, like there's a lot of, I would say like uncertainty of like where he's going to be. And that kind of spooks me again, really, really high in the draft. I'm looking for something that I know I can bank on and I know I can sort of work with. And I know the job that's going to be important in the NHL that that player is going to have. Whereas with Salayev, it's just more that he's this very unique profile of a player who is still pretty raw, I think, like still a bit of a work in progress, but, you know, certainly on the right track. I think he's a lot better at the end of the year than he was at the beginning of the year, for sure. Um, and I've seen him a lot. Uh, the thing is like in the games that I've seen, like he's not like the thing with saliva that I always come away with is he's not doing anything. Like he's very, very reserved. Like his offensive transition numbers are very passive and quiet defensively. They're just as passive and quiet. Uh, he doesn't really shoot the puck a tremendous amount. His team doesn't really shoot the puck a tremendous amount. Um, it's just a very low event hockey type player, but his passing and the vision, like he keep, when he keeps it simple, it's a lot better. Yeah. And, and so for me, it's like, well, okay. So you have a really tall guy who is not terribly thin, not saying that as an insult, but like he's pretty built up as, as he is. I think he's already beyond 200 pounds by quite a bit. Um, you know, he, any, he, and he skates really, really well. Right. Like that's that's the thing that he kind of brings to the table is just how good of a skater he is for that size. Yeah. And that doesn't come around. That doesn't come around very much. But with with Levshinov, like my my pitch on Levshinov to counter what you said is just I think about what the NHL is like. And with Levshinov, I can just see with the right coaching and the like you can see it already with Levshinov, kind of what you what you're going to get and what he can do. I can, I, and I can, especially in this year's draft again, like I can easily see a world where you draft Levshinov and you go, you know what? Like he may not, I don't think he projects as a super heavy offensive guy, but the, the physical defensive play and the, the ability, like his backwards mobility isn't great, but neither is, I mean, and Salives is a little better. Like, I don't know. This is a draft right now where I'm months into this and I'm still sitting there going, I don't know. Like, <laughs> There's so many guys where I just, I don't know. And with Salayev, a lot of the time, there's just not much happening with him on the ice. But with Levshinov, it's a lot more, you know, he, you, you can see he wants to be involved in play. He's getting around the ice. He's, you know, he's powerful. He's strong. It's, he's shooting with everything Sali he can. <laughs> he's shoot, yeah, he shoots the puck a lot for sure. He's shooting a lot. Um, but with Salayev, like, yeah, I think the big thing that I've noticed as a negative is what you said was happening in the third period, where on puck retrievals and just 
reading oncoming pressure and you know he'll try to spin off pressure and evade guys with his feet it's just not there yet in that sense um but in terms of managing gaps and closing gaps and all those things you like to see out of defensemen he does it pretty well but i don't know with Salayev, it's it's very much uh how much do you value like with helenius it's like how much do you value a guy who is extremely smart and the rest is a big murky picture Whereas with Salayev, it's how much do you trust how rare it is to have a guy that tall with that that good a set of feet under him, but the rest is a work in progress. The rest is still kind of a a, a bit of a work in progress, right? Yeah. So yeah, like I get your it, and, and, for sure, it, it makes sense. Yeah, it's it's just a difference in a, a philosoph- philosophical difference in a way where it's like there are other guys where I can more clearly see where they're gonna you know where they are and where they could be. Whereas with Salayev, I'm just like, well, I mean, is there a world where he's a top pair defenseman in the NHL? I don't know. I don't think so. But I think it's is possible. There a world... It's just he's not going to yeah. be the driver of that unit. He's going to be more the drive play through defense and he can move the yeah. puck because he's a decent well, puck mover from what I've seen as well. Right. Like if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's yeah, he's decent. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. He's decent at it. You know, again, when he keeps it simple, he's effective. Yep. So I don't know, maybe you draft him and Alphonse Frey in the same draft and just play them together forever, right? <laughs> like, and they just play off of each other. I don't know. I think that but, would look good, the two of them. Yeah, together. like some, but like that kind of a role, right? Like if you draft Salayev and put him next to a guy who, you know, has a bit more skill and puck carrying ability and a bit more oomph to him and a little bit more offensive pop, then great, right? Like, I don't know what teams at the high end have that ready to go but i could see it he, he's an interesting one um but again like <laughs> there's a lot of guys like this in this year's draft where it, they're just a they're just a weird weird profile you don't see all the time uh especially valued so highly um do you have any closing thoughts on the guy because always curious to hear your thoughts um yeah, I think I just mi- missed that he is a pretty good skater for his size. Like, I probably should have led with that. I don't know why I didn't, but that's also part <laughs> of the How dare thoughts. you? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I just thought he was pretty good. And I think I'd take him over Levshinov because guys who shoot the puck like crazy kind of drive me insane. And you could definitely coach that out of Levshinov, but it's like, it, it really does leave a bad taste in my mouth when I'm watching it. <laughs> All you're doing is firing the puck on dead at yeah. every single opportunity you get. So I don't know. I just, I like his skating. I like the way he moves the puck when he's keeping it simple. He's huge, which is not something that you hear us like waxing poetic about, but all the, all the it, tools he has, I think there could be yeah. a, a pretty good defenseman there. Not the most insane player in the world, but a guy that I totally understand why teams would go up there and draft him super, super high because those skill sets don't come around a lot. And when they do, they tend to get those guys get picked even higher than you and I would do it necessarily. But I like him. Yeah. So, yeah, that's where I'm at. He's fine. Again, like he's fine. He's an interesting idea of a player. And maybe there's something there. Um, Okay, so uh, we're going to quickly go through uh, Craig Button and Scott Wheeler. Someone asked about uh, Wheeler on Monday, and we didn't get to it, of course. Um, these are interesting. These the, 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 the way things are happening is getting interesting for me. Um, so just so you know, uh, I, I, can't, I, won't, I won't give the specifics on Wheelers because it's paywalled, uh, but Craig's list that came out today, Craig Button, uh, and again... I, you know, all the respect in the world for Craig Button, super nice dude, you know, he's, he's there. Uh, but this is, you know, we'll say his top 10 and and the rest you can check out uh, if you just Google it. Um, but his top 10 starting at 10 is TJ Ginla, then Caden Lindstrom, uh, Cole Iserman, Constant Hellenius at seven, Sam Dickinson at six, Archie Mlevchenov at five, Zeev Buyam at four, Zane Parekh at three. Uh, oh, yeah. Ivan Demidov at two <laughs> and Macklin Celebrini. He did mention also that Jet Lachenko was not on his list in January and now he's at 21. So there's just that. Um, and Ivan Demidov was at five. He is now at two. Uh, and I'm just trying to pull up some other stuff in this list that stuck out to me. EJ Emery at 22 is pretty crazy. Jacob Jakob Fibiger 
uh, defenseman in Mississauga at 25 is uh, wild to me. I, I watched Fibiger earlier in the year and I liked him. And then I tracked a couple of games of him and he was, if you like skatey defensemen who aren't super big and like, I didn't really like Fibiger's defensive game, like at all uh, at, at that level. And, you know, Mississauga was kind of one of those teams that just pushed offense a lot. They have a young team and, and they really push things offensively. Excuse me. Um, you know, and, and, you know, like there's just a lot of like Julius Mietnan at 17. I've come to like Julius Mietnan, uh, but again, like not that much. Like maybe I could see a team taking him at 30 and you get a, a decent third line center there. He's got the size. He has the skating ability. You know, he reads play well. Uh, I could see why people like Mietnan, but again, like what you would be leaving, like if Mietnan is there at 17 and Igor Chernyshov and Trevor Connolly, even Jet Lachenko, Michael Hage, all those guys are still on the board and you're telling me that you're going to go with Mietnan, I would, I would have questions about that. Like it's, it just, again, it's this very like, uninspired type of pick right where it's you know to me it's like he i could see him being an nhl player right like if you just want a guy to go out there and play minutes he can do it uh but like two picks he's ranked two slots behind berkeley catton who's at 15 on his list which just seems like crazy it just seems really crazy to me um you know, but I mean, I'm not going to pick these apart. Like I'm not a huge fan of a lot of these players though. Right. Like Nilo Pekka, Muhonen. Um, I don't mind Raul Boyard, but I don't, again, like top 40 seems crazy to me, especially ahead of like Beckett Seneke, um, you know, Spencer Gill at 44 between guys like Galvis and Mugli ahead of guys like Solberg, uh, Alphonse Frey at 49. Um, Artemana 51 like there's just a lot of weird stuff in there um you know like EJ Emery in the 20s and Will Skayen at 64 like I see those two players as somewhat similar um and seeing them 40 picks apart is also very confusing to me so who I don't know it's it with Craig it's very interesting I I don't like the thing about Craig button that I don't quite understand is like what his philosophy is like generally with scouting work, I like to be able to look at a list and go, okay, I see kind of like what you would push for in a certain range, but with, you know, like, do we, do we like defensemen who can defend like people seem to think a guy like Levshinov can, well, then why is Zane Parekh at three? Right. Like, do we value smart players and set aside a lot of talent based things? Well, then why is Berkeley Catton at 15? Right. Like, do we, do we, and, and if we do do that, if we do value smarts, then Jet Lachenko at 21 makes a lot of sense. But a guy like Consta Hellenius is behind a guy like Levshinov or, or behind a guy like Dickinson, even. So to me, it's, it's just like I kind of have trouble parsing through this and sort of going, okay, I kind of see what you know, what is a top priority for him? Uh, or at least like the types of players that are fitting those priorities for him. That's the only thing really that I have to say. Um, but it's, you know, like there's just a lot of guys in here where I'm going, okay, these guys are big, but I don't quite see the whole picture with those guys yet. Uh, and Jakob Fibiger is there who, I don't know. Maybe I got to see him again. It's been a while since I saw him because I watched a bunch of games of him early in the year. And the more I watched, the more I went, mm, I don't know. But if he's had a strong couple of months, then I would believe it because I liked him for a little while. But I didn't. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't quite see a top round player there for me. Um. But on the Scott Wheeler, uh, I'll just say like Scott Wheeler has Cole Eiserman still really high, and I. I, I saw Eiserman the other day and I still think that there's a lot of like bad habits there with him. Like you park him with the right players. He'll score goals. He's one of those guys. You put him on a line with the right players. He'll score goals, but he's also a guy who loves to have the puck on his own stick and loves to try to do stuff on his own. And I think that can drive people nuts because sometimes that ends in him along the goal line in the corner, shooting the puck. And that's not really going to help you out. Even Connor Bedard has stopped doing that generally. Um, he also has Zane Parekh really high. Uh, 
you know, there's just a run of defensemen, Parekh, Dickinson, Buyam, Salayev. Um, and I, I think the other thing too is like, I was just reading through some of his write-ups and again, like, I, no disrespect to Scott at all, but like, there's a lot of talk about what other people think about these players. So I've spoken to these people who really like this player. I've spoken to these people who really like this player. And to me, like that, are you like, it's, it's interesting to see people in this world who I think there is a big, like not big, but there is a certain amount of weight dedicated to what, like trying to anticipate what the NHL is going to actually do on draft day, trying to say, well, I might not be as big a fan of this player, but the team that coaches this player adores him and thinks he's going to be sick. So I'm going to see if I'm wrong and, and hedge my bets and trust them on this. Or three scouts with NHL teams said they have Carter Yakumchuk top five. I have him at 25. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm going to maybe push him up a little bit because NHL people like him a lot. Like to me, that's almost a different, that's a different, that's a different school basically like that's a different you know that's a different world to me uh like i i i only really just go here's what i think and it's gonna be diff very different from a lot of people and probably extremely different from how the nhl goes but i'd rather be like all right well i i i left what other people think sort of as much out of it as i possibly can um especially when i hear like oh well nhl teams like this person a lot Right. Like Carter Yakumchuk is, I think, in my 40s or something, like late 30s. And I watched him again this week and didn't move him up a whole lot, you know, like, and I'm going to stick to that. And if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. Um, but the point of the whole work for me is at the, you know, at the day one, you know, on the draft day, who is the name that comes off your list? It's easy to rank players. It is not easy to sit there and go, this is the one that we want. And we're going to wait maybe 30 picks. We're going to let 30 other people take the guy that they have number one. So at our pick, we got to make sure that our guy at number one is the best player we can possibly find because we might not get a chance to draft someone else, right? So how you how you do that, there's lots of different ways you can think about it. But for me, it's like my, that's my job, right? My job is to get here's the here's the pick. Who are we going with? And are we comfortable leaving on the board what we're leaving on the board, regardless of what we think is going to happen between here and our next pick? So, I mean, like, I'm looking at this list. Like, Aaron Kiviharyu in the mid-first round, I after how he played at the beginning of the year, I just cannot see myself with a drafting a kid, an underside, like, this, and this is also what I mean by, like, the the restrictions put on certain types of people are applied very differently. Like Aaron Kivi Haru objectively did not play a great seven games in Liga this year. He was not great in Liga last year either. He's 5'9, he's 170 pounds, he gets beat defensively all the time. But even though he's been hurt all year, he's a top 20 pick, right? Why? Like, wh why? I don't, I don't understand. You know, like, uh, there's just no, ev there, there's literally no evidence for that. So to me, it's, it's, a, it's a scary proposition all things considered like Adam Jiracek, like he, you, you can at least look at how he played in the Czech league and go, okay, he was outmatched there, but I thought he was great at the world juniors before he got injured. And he was, uh, I thought showed a lot of potential and a lot of signs that there's something there with a guy like that at that level. It's just, it wasn't fully there yet. Like watching him at the junior level, you can see a lot more of it. It's just the men's game is very different. And and I found that Kiwi Haru was not showing those similar signs for me. Um, but other than that, I mean, like, I've just kind of relinquished myself to the thought of Tarek Parasak in the first round at this point. It seems like that's going to happen. Um, Leo Celine Wolanius, I watched another game of his. He's another one where people keep putting him in the first round or early second. And every game I watch, I go, I, I don't. I don't know. I don't think so, but I, I, I don't know. Uh, but in any case, um, again, like this is just other, you know, my read of this based on having watched, I'd, I don't think there's a single player on either of these lists that I've never seen before uh, and never seen like at least a couple of games of. 
Um, maybe Max Plant is a guy who I haven't seen enough of. Um, I also just really enjoy how many honorable mentions uh, Scott Wheeler puts in his lists. Not as a bad thing, but it's just hilarious to me. Just there's like a billion names here. As many names that are ranked uh, are honorable mentions to me, which is fun. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't have a tremendous amount to say about all this, all these guys. It's just interesting the kind of things that I think I'm picking up. Uh, so before we get to all of the questions of today, we're going to briefly talk about some some NHL games we've seen and, and what's coming up. Uh, just to also bring AJ back into the conversation a little bit more. <laughs> cool. This is, he is here. He is still here too. Yeah. Um, but my game from Monday night was Nashville Vegas. Uh, Nashville ended up winning that one in overtime, so it's not a total loss for Vegas. I only got to see bits and pieces of it. Um, so I won't give a huge breakdown of it. And we also need to get to a lot of the questions that we have. Uh, but the one I'm going to be watching from here until Monday is going to be Toronto, Washington tonight, actually, uh, Toronto obviously just came off a game against New Jersey where they got just handed a loss by Jake Allen, just on a platter. Um, it was, (laughs) it was so brutal. You know, if you're a Toronto person, it's brutal. Uh, New Jersey managed to pop them for six, even though I mean one of them was an empty netter. But was it one? Uh, a bit I of a two demor- of them were. Was it? I'm pretty sure. It was I thought two. they scored. Was it? Well, okay. Either way, uh, unpleasant game for the Toronto Maple Leafs, and you know the New Jersey Devils. I don't think New Jersey's or Washington. I mean, Washington's really pushing for the playoffs. Uh, Toronto is like how you bounce back from a game where you get goalied. I think is perfect playoff prep. You know, like you, you, the goalie went out there and stopped 45 saves. So how do you sort of mentally reset, come back and, and try to beat the, beat the Washington yeah, Capitals because the, like, the Capitals you know, want to get in. Had more than like half their shots in the first period and they were losing yeah. 2-1 at that point. And then they made it 3-2 and like maybe 30 seconds after the Leafs had taken the lead, it was right. back to tied. So it was one of those games but, where I was yelling at my television because... <laughs> Man, if they just played faster, this so, so much of this could have been avoided, I feel like. That's hockey. To quote Gino Retta, that's hockey, baby. Yep. That's just how it goes. Yep. And, um, uh, soon what about you? you'll be quoting you... Gino Retta as he says, blow it up <laughs> very <laughs> shortly. Yeah, after, exactly. After the yeah. season's over. <laughs> yeah, after Toronto blows it in the first round against Boston or something. Uh, okay, well, over our, over to you. Sure. Yeah, go go over what you've done, and then we'll get to the chat questions. Okay, cool. So the games I had was uh, Bruins-Panthers, because I looked at that game as the Panthers potentially being able to really take hold of uh, the number one spot, and they lost. <laughs> and they didn't. <laughs> and uh, they were winning that game with, like, five minutes left, which is a theme that uh, you'll see mm. in the other game. And, uh, I mean, but they lost to Tampa yesterday, so that, that first spot is still up for grabs. It's kind of crazy how the seeding is going in the Atlantic division where you don't know who's going to finish where. Like, Tampa could finish third. The Leafs could finish in a wild card spot. Florida could finish first or second, and same with Boston. Like, those matchups aren't decided yet, so that it's a pretty interesting division still, I think, in terms of figuring out seeding. Uh, and the other one I had was Washington versus uh, Detroit because that game oh, basically God. was can the Red Wings claw within this or yeah. are Washington going to run away? And uh, five minutes left, thereabouts, and uh, it was 3-2 Detroit, and they blew it. At least Detroit got a point for their own sake, but man. <laughs> for their sanity. Well, they're still kind of in it, but I think they're yeah, playing the Hurricanes it's not over. tonight or – or on Saturday, so they've got a tough schedule. Yeah, that's a tough one. But they um, are playing Carolina tonight. Yeah, and, I, and then they play um, Washington plays Carolina on Saturday. But my games of the week: uh, Vegas, Winnipeg. I think that's going to be an interesting one because Vegas, they probably have enough leeway to take the take the spot, the wild card spot in the West. But it's going to be an interesting test for them to play up against Winnipeg, who have. I believe have been struggling recently. I don't. Yep. I I don't more than they were last game. How they finished the last game, but I think uh, they've been they've been on a bit of a downward trend. So I want to see what happens there. And then L.A. Edmonton, we're gonna get round three of this series. It yeah. seems like, and uh, this I'll is just watch as many of those games as I can. Yeah. yeah, both of those games are tonight. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, yeah for sure. Well, uh, let's go to the chat questions. Well, the chat questions will come last, but we got a bunch of questions in advance of the show. 
uh, and we're going to bang through them. But yeah, and then eventually we'll get to the chat question. So if you have them, fire away and uh, let's get cracking here. Yeah. Uh, so the first, yes. Oh, I, oh, yeah, I was saying, yeah. Well, we're going to have to <laughs> okay. try and get through these pretty quick, yeah. I think, because there's gonna there's a lot today. And thank you guys for there is. Uh, sending yes. all of them our way. We really do appreciate Much obliged. it. obliged. Yeah. Uh, so the first question came all the way from across the pond in the UK. Uh, which NHL organization is going to be bold and offer Liam Kirk a real shot at making it in North America? I think we're a ways away from that. I know he had a pretty good year in Czechia um, after a decent year in Finland, but I don't know. Liam Kirk, based on, I've seen him a little bit here and there, just by proxy of watching him or watching other teams. And he happens to be on the ice over the last couple of years. Uh, I mean, he's a trigger man, really, right? Like he's a good shooter. Uh, I, I don't think there's an NHL player there, um, but I feel like a long and storied European career is certainly within the cards and plenty of world, ju- world championship appearances for Liam Kirk in the future, for sure. Trying to keep Great Britain uh, up in that top division. Uh, can you compare Raul Boyard and Julius Mietnin and give your preference? Yeah, I mean, they're kind of similar-ish in a way. I like Mietnin more just because I think he's a better skater and I think he's a little more physical and, and he's, I think, a little bit bigger than Boyard. Um, I think Boyard is a better player with the puck on his stick, if that makes sense. Like, he, I think, reads play quite well. Um, Boyard finds his way through traffic pretty well rather than like a Mietnin's more of like a raw power guy and, and, and off puck. He's very smart. I think Mietnin's a better off puck player than Boyard, but Boyard, I think with how he sort of chooses his routes and how to get through players, I think he does that better. Um, I, but I prefer Mietnin just because I feel like he'll keep up with a higher pace of play better. Um, I think he's just naturally a more physical player than Boyard is. Um, but, and, and with Boyard, like the offense has been really come and go with him. And I just haven't seen enough, like sort of high end offensive tools where I can sort of say he's more of an offensive player. Um, but I think Mietnin is just a nice, maybe depth guy down the lineup that can play in the NHL. Uh, a team is going to take Archem Levshinov high. We know what faults he has, but what good things are a team getting? It's a good question. Cause I, I think. You know, I think I'm guilty of when I'm skeptical about a player making it sound like they're not great or very useful. Um, I think with Levshinov, like, I think he's a smart short distance puck mover. Like, he he times things quite well uh, with his breakouts. Um, you know, he is willing to be very physical, which is, you got to have that in the NHL. If you're going to play some kind of role in the NHL, that's, that's you got to have at least that, and he's got it. Um, I don't think he's the most mobile defender, but he is a decent gap controller. Uh, it's just like when guys sort of drop a shoulder and, and push through him, it's a little bit too easy to get around him or to get through him. Um, but I do really like sort of the approach to the game that he has. And honestly, like we've kind of poked at how he's acting like a bit of a forward from time to time in the, in the NHL but, or in the, uh, in the NCAA, but I mean, in the right system, I don't think I mind it that much. Like if he wants to be the guy that goes to the net and you've got wingers or a center who you're there, you you look at them and you go, look, you're going to be on the ice with this guy and our system, we're going to let him sort of pinch up a little bit more often than you might be used to. So keep your eyes on him and and be sure to fill in the the space that he empties by, by doing that. And you play in a more of a positionless, you know, environment. And then I could see a, a value in a guy like Levshinov and how he produces and how he could be a productive defenseman in the NHL. Um, but I think he's maybe more destined to be a second pair guy who, you know, skates well, plays physical, moves the puck decently well. Um, and can, you know, and once in a while he does make pretty nice plays right off the blue line, right? Like he'll, you know, he spots seams, cross ice, cross crease from the blue line, which is pretty hard to do. Um, but he just, it, those opportunities also just don't present themselves a ton. Um, but yeah, I, I, there are good things about him. I just, again, like I'm seeing him second, third, fourth, fifth overall. And I think that that's just, especially considering the caliber of player that you could get like in a Berkeley Catton or an Ivan Demidov. I just think that Levshinov is behind those guys. And I mean, AJ, if you have anything else to add, yeah, feel free. I, I Cause you've just a seen lot of that. Um, I just think they're going to get a solid guy at the end of the day, potentially. Like I think he can. I don't know cuz I didn't see a ton of them. I saw one one big yeah. game. But I feel like they're just going to get 
a solid defenseman who you're going to have to kind of tame to or train to not shoot everything. <laughs> but I like them. I think, like I said, I think there is a role as a second pair guy potentially there for him who can be more solid. And yep. yeah, but also going back to what you say about, because when you like try and flag concerns on players, it always does come off as like this sort of negative connotation. Like, cause yeah. the same way I think for me and Ovi, where I will, where I always <laughs> say the, the bad things, but it's more to raise attention to that than really take a, a big dump on the player themselves. It's sure. just, you kind of advertise the things that you don't feel like are being talked about enough. A lot of the times. And I, right. I, I, when I say you, I mean generally, I think. So yeah, yeah. Yep. I think it's just a natural thing. But just because we say things that are a little, like they may look, what's a good, or harsh, doesn't right. mean we dislike the player at all. Well, it's, it's you know, like, it, yeah, like it's honesty, really, right? Because like hockey is a game where it is really hard to be good at everything, right? Like the whole point, the whole point, from my perspective is to better understand what you're getting and what might need work real. Right. Like with Levshinov to me, it's like, yeah, he, he's going to need training with his skating. I think, especially laterally to sort of close those gaps and use his, use his lower body to really play more physically and shut guys down. And is that impossible to do? Absolutely not. Right. Like he can do it. It's just, it's It needs to be highlighted because otherwise we're just waxing poetic about all these guys. And, and it's just sort of like talk. I mean, maybe it's more marketable to just talk about how awesome all these guys are, but you know, then I end, I feel like you're just setting up the audience for disappointment on players. And, and this is how kind of prospects get overvalued. Um, and in reality, a lot of these guys, it comes down to like, it's not going to be, well, they can just go out on the NHL ice and do whatever they want. Right. It's, it's, they have to be able to go out on the ice and, and perform a role. Right. Or, or at least a couple of different roles and, and, the whole point for me, my, my core philosophy is I want to find as many players as I can that can do as many things as they can in the NHL. Like that's the ideally it. Cause then you close all your gaps as best you can rather than, Oh, well this player could play this role, but anything else is a work in progress. I just find that a little less valuable. So it's just a matter of like getting as good a picture as you can um, rather than like coming off as just like being an ass because i don't want to do that i don't or you know, being it's a, a it's total a, cheerleader about everything or that do, yeah right? either way you don't right need to like, be my grandmother about me <laughs> <laughs> right yeah we don't need to be yeah we don't need to be that um no i do appreciate it <laughs> yeah uh before we move on i am curious uh i do want to start tracking your leaderboard so don't let me forget uh while we add guys to your list i think we should do a running oh, okay order of that so i pasted it in the notes just for the future reference absolutely but anyway I'll we can move on filing a list that you can all dunk on me for yeah dunk 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 uh which of the top defensemen uh will make the easiest transition to the nhl and who will likely have the best career in their prime and they mentioned dickinson levshinov salayev buyam parek and juracek so i think levshinov will probably be the guy that an NHL coach is most comfortable throwing into the NHL right away, not right away, right away, but like pretty early, mostly because of the way that he plays and like the way that he's wired. Um, you know, it's just a safer bet for NHL coaches to put over the boards. I think, I think Dickinson, you know, I think he needs another year in junior, uh, or if you subscribe to, to <laughs> yeah, maybe two, like, or if you subscribe to Sam McGilligan, he might just need to leave the London Knights and play for hockey Canada for a year or something. Um, I think Saliva is a ways away. I think Booyam is a ways away. Parekh. I, I don't, I don't know. I, who's coaching him, right? Like who, well, who's the team that drafts him? Who's coaching him? What's the plan? I don't know. Uh, and Adam Jiracek. I would say he'll have, I think Jiracek when he does hopefully eventually get to the NHL will transition pretty seamlessly just because he's got the length. He's got the skating ability. He's got the, the sort of dependable pass vision and, and, and all of that stuff. Uh, it's just with him. It's like how much more in the sort of offensive direction can you extract out of him? But I think he'll transition decently. Well, um, best career in their prime if all goes well for these guys, I don't know. I want to say Jiracek, but 
I don't know if that's l- the likeliest. Maybe a Buyum, a a Buyum or a Salayev. Like if everything goes right for Anton Salayev, I think it could be him. Um, I don't know. Sam Dickinson also is just like a who knows what he is, right? Like I did another game of him this week, and it was more of what I feel is going on with him. Uh, but you know. I guess if there's signs of something there and it's just his environment that's limiting him, then I can't disagree. Yeah. I think um, Dickinson yeah. could probably be the highest upside guy of those, of the bunch it's just will really do something with it. Right. Cause you can see everything there. He's got all the right ingredients for the soup, but the season, he hasn't put the seasoning in yet is what it feels <laughs> right. like. Well, all the ingredients are out on the countertop and he's like, look, yes, I made that's, soup. That's what it is. And you're like, no, you didn't. You haven't made soup yet. Like, you haven't cut the carrots and put them in. Yeah, exactly. Like, you you got, yeah, you got unpeeled potatoes. Uh, anyway, who's the best defensive forward in the draft? Is it maybe Br- Michael Brunsegg, Newgard, or uh, Consta Hellenius? Um, the best defensive forward in the draft? I mean, Br- Michael, Michael Brunsegg, Newgard is a good guess I would throw in there um yeah i don't feel like it's hellenius after no i don't think so um tj ginla certainly tries to be that um who else um i watched igor chernishov yesterday and he actually made some really nice defensive plays but i wouldn't put him there either um is he playing in where where in russia is he playing because i imagine (laughs) dinamo moscow Okay, and he's NHL played, or he's KHL? Played, he's, KHL. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, it's a good question because it's also like there aren't a ton of them, at least not at the high end of the draft. Um, 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 yeah, probably Bransig Newgard then. Yeah, probably. Yeah. If, I, if I'm taking this long to think about it, probably him then. Um, but yeah, probably. Okay. Uh, thoughts on Christopher Thibodeau. Uh, Christopher Thibodeau plays for the Kingston Frontenacs. I really like him. I think Thibodeau is going to be one of those guys who falls really far in the draft. Um, and if you're a team that's not afraid of drafting sort of smaller players, uh, Thibodeau is a guy who I think you could just take a swing on, and he's probably going to be a better hockey player than a lot of the guys drafted in, in the round or two before him. Um a really like he kind of reminds me of what I felt about Kenta Izagai a couple of years ago. Although Izagai didn't play as many minutes and he was not scoring as much. And he was he was an undersized guy who worked really hard, skated really hard, uh, and also did not take bad shots. Christopher Thibodeau is among the leaders in my data set for shooting right from high danger slot areas. Um, he's a playmaker in those areas as well. Like he drives great data offensively for me. And and is no slouch defensively either. Like uh, the last game I did of him, he was really quiet. But the last few before that, I think I've done four of him at this point, and I've seen a couple more. Uh, I thought he looked really, really interesting. Um, maybe a guy like he's on my short list uh, to be picked for uh, my fake organization. Um, but I don't think I would touch him until a few rounds in just because guys like him are really hard to project to the NHL and he doesn't really have the sort of speed and, and evasiveness that a guy like a Luke Misa has. Um, but he certainly has like that drive and that determination to, to get pucks into areas where you're likely to score some points. So how far that takes him, I don't know, but I, I do think he's under the radar a little bit. Um, tell us your favorite prospect that won't get drafted. Uh, this one's easy. Cause I watched this guy the other day. And if you're in the discord server, you will, I posted a few clips of him. Uh, Jacob Tarion of the North Bay battalion is such a piece of garbage hockey player. I love him. He's like five, nine, five, eight, but he will, he, w- he will kill you. If, if it was allowed to kill a person in hockey, he would do it. Like he, he like, he was hacking and whacking guys behind play. Uh, he cross-checked a guy right in the spine in front of the net, like defending him, uh, like just blatant trash, uh, which I love. I mean, but also like normally I wouldn't be a huge fan of that, but he's also a pretty good hockey player, right? Like he's quick on his feet, wicked shooter, great skill level. Uh, didn't play a ton of minutes for North Bay this year, but per 60 minutes at even strength, he actually scored at a pretty good rate. Um, 
and you know what? Like as a complimentary offensive guy, you know, like where things kind of go wrong for him is is settling pucks in transition for sure and making quick thinking in terms of his passing. He can kind of hold onto the puck a little too long, um, you know, and and just sort of make low percentage plays a little bit too much. But he is not taking the foot off the gas pedal defensively. He he hustles, he grinds. I saw him throw, I think it was Caleb Lawrence. And if you don't know who Caleb Lawrence is, I think he's six seven or six eight. I saw him throw Caleb Lawrence into Caleb Lawrence's own bench. Like he actually pushed like from the seat of his pants. He pushed him into the bench. Like he's just such a rat. And I don't think he's gonna get drafted, but I love it. And honestly, like if he's the next uh, uh who is the guy that played on da- Dallas for a while? Antoine Roussel or um Maxime Lapierre, Ryan Lomberg comes to mind. Like if he I he reminds me a lot of like a Ryan Lomberg. You mean Nick Cousins. Is, <laughs> or that too, right? Like, but I don't think he's as good a hockey player as Nick Cousins is who scores decently. But Ryan, Ryan Lomberg is pretty decent too, though. To be yeah, fair. but that's what I mean. Like a Jacob Terrian. Yeah, like, but Jacob Terrian is not a bad hockey player, and I think there's signs of something there, but mostly just because he's such a piece of garbage out there, which I, I love about him. Uh, it's admirable. Like, it's it's kind of like the Ryan Gosling character in The Big Short with the line where it's like, he's so, he you you dislike this person so much that you respect them. It's like, I, I get it. Um, any good defensemen who are big and skate well, but are underrated because they don't have a lot of points aside from the obvious ones we know about, like Badinka and Stein Solberg, uh, I'd throw Adam Cleaver in there, uh, and, uh, a Swedish kid, Viggo Gustafsson. Um, I've liked Viggo Gustafsson as a sort of safe and dependable defense first guy. He's pretty big. He's got a bit of skill. He skates pretty well, you know, sits back a lot, but I like him. Uh, and Adam Cleaver is a guy who I think just shows a lot of potential. Like if we're talking about, Anton Salayev and how being a big guy who can really skate uh, is an advantage. I think Adam Kleber is not that far behind. Like he's not as good a skater, but I think he's a very skilled defenseman um, who just needs to round things out a little bit. He kind of, he, he makes passes a little bit too quickly and, and into traffic a lot. Um, but sometimes he is at the blue line and drops a shoulder. He's six, five, and he just barrels to the net um, you know, and he sort of jumps into the offensive zone from time to time and tries to join in the offense a little bit more than you would expect. And so I, I like that about him. Uh, and he might be a guy you can snag a little later on. Um, Michael Hage versus Sacha Boisvert. So I, uh, have Boisvert on the list to go over before Monday. Um, so I will bump that one out, but from what I've seen so far, uh, I'm going to lean Michael Hage just because I think he's a smarter player with the puck than Boisvert. Like Boisvert is much more of a, he's one of these guys where I, I there's gotta be a saying for it, but it's like, you know, he, it, he, he's trying to like jam too much into a jar type hockey player. Like he's just every, every time he touches the puck, he's trying to like force something to happen that isn't really going to happen. Whereas Michael Hage creates a little bit more. And I think he sort of, gets around pressure a little bit better and, and sneaks around guys a little bit better. Whereas Boisvert is sort of like a brute force, you know, up and down the ice kind of guy. Um, so I think I lean Hage, but I'll have an updated look on Boisvert by Monday. Uh, what's the deal with Merrick Vanneker? Uh, a, a, a pretty projectable complimentary offensive guy. Doesn't really do a whole lot in transition for you, but when he does, it's usually effective. Like, Give me the puck and I'll find a guy in the neutral zone. Uh, you know, he he protects the puck pretty well. He gets greasy along the boards quite well. Um, he goes to the scoring areas both on and off the puck. Um, so I can see why NHL teams look at him and just go, yeah, he gets it. This guy just seems to play a game where you put him with certain types of players and I feel like it would work. Um, I have him just outside the first round, I think in the 30s or 40s for me. Um, but I mean, if he's a late round pick because you have a lot of speed and skill or or whatever on your team and you just want something a little bit different to sort of link up guys on the ice through passing and a bit of carrying here and there, then I think Vanneker's a guy, for, an interesting one. Uh, and uh, and Brian Stewart's last question, he dumped like six on me. Uh, what overagers do you <laughs> not, do you like that aren't named Yuri Tihachek 
who we already know is Bobby Orr combined with Nicholas Lidstrom? That's that's a great phrased <laughs> question. Um, I pulled a few uh, that I do kind of like. So uh, Dylan Herkoyan, um playing for Northeastern. His brother just got signed by the Dallas Stars. I liked him last year. He's had a great freshman year uh, this year in college. Um, he's maybe one I'd take a look at. Arvid Bergstrom in Sweden. Um, you know, I've seen him a few times this year. I still think he should have been drafted last year. You know, just a high skill, high pace defenseman definitely needs work defensively, but boy, is he ever talented whenever he, you know, is on the puck or, or getting around the ice. There's just a lot to work with there. Isaac Hedquist, um, I think he's just a great up and down the ice energy guy, really interesting player uh, who sh- probably should have been drafted last year, but um, I don't know if he'll get drafted this year, but he's been interesting when I've seen him in the SHL this year. Uh, speaking of Sweden, staying in, in Sweden, we're going to go to Petter Westerheim, uh, Norwegian playing in the second division. Again, a guy who probably should have been drafted last year, but um, just a really quick, agile guy who I don't know if he's a huge potential NHL guy, but you know he needs to fill out. Um, but I think there's a lot there's a lot to like. Uh, the other ones I'll just fire off quick. Gennady Chali, who I liked last year, really skilled, high high energy defenseman. Um, really good shooter, tons of skill, definitely an offensive leaning guy who I think has a lot of headroom to develop. Um, there was a guy I watched this past week uh, for Ilvis's minor team, uh, Emil Laurel, who's an 04, who I who has just been dominant in the Finnish Junior League this year um, and played pretty well at the uh, Mestis level when I watched him there. Uh, and Jesse Polkanen is in there as well, who is just one of a kind, uh, such an interesting player. Like, I can't sit here and say he's not good, but it's, I just don't know how good he actually is. And I don't know how it's going to work in the NHL. And I can't wait to find out. I just, he's fascinating. So I'd throw him in there as well. Um, who's a player who is highly touted in this year's draft class, but you have huge, cons- huge concerns about? I'd throw Zane Parekh out there. I just, especially now that I'm seeing him ranked like top five more often than not now, I just think that that is such a risky call. Uh, and I mean, I've seen people talk about how concerns about his defense is overblown. I I don't, I, I don't agree. I think that it's a, an issue. Um, and even his offensive game, I think is difficult to project to the next level, but I've been wrong before. I just think top five for him is nutty and I have him more in the mid to late first round for me. Um, what else do we have going on here in terms of questions? Is Jacob Perot officially in bust territory as his production continues to flounder in Laval? I mean, I guess you could consider him that. He was a late first round pick. Um, I mean, he was always a bit of a weird one in terms of just the, the, he was, he, again, he was one of those guys uh, where he was shooting the puck a lot, but it wasn't from scoring areas, right? Like, if there's anything in my data that you can carry forward as something that is troubling for a player, it's when they score a bunch of points, but not from scoring areas, right? Like Cole Eisenman is up that alley. Trevor. (laughs) Right. Unless their name is Joshua. Uh, yes. Um, but like, um, yeah, those guys, uh, Trevor Connolly this year is like that a lot of points, but just a lot of perimeter shooting. Um, so not saying that those guys are going to bust, but, uh, but I think that these guys are, um, it's, it's something to note. Uh, Alex Holtz was another one. Oliver Wallstrom was another one though. So those guys all come to mind. Um, so Jacob Perot, I mean, again, like with him as well, I don't remember his sort of off puck game being particularly, uh, particularly good. Like he was very much, a give me the puck. I'm going to carry it up the ice and shoot it kind of guy. Um, he could, he has a heck of a shot, but again, like, he's another one where if you're leading your draft profile on a player with how good of a shooter he is, to me, that's not as important a quality, especially because you can work on that over the next five years, if you really wanted to. Uh, Where do you think Alphonse Frey will go in the draft too late? Uh, I would think he goes somewhere before 50. I hope Um, maybe like late thirties, early forties, possibly if it were me, it would be way earlier, but Probably around there. Um, how do you think Salayev's front-loaded production affected his high ranking? I think it's a major reason he's seen as so high. Like, he's a big, good skating guy, but I think he had, like, nine of his points this season in the first, like, 12 games, I want to say, or something like that. 
it was crazy early on people were talking about how much of an incredible player he was and like oh my there were like people posting every point he had and daily posting that Anton Salaev continues his historic rate of scoring in the in the KHL and I don't know I I remember watching those clips that everyone was posting and I'm going he he shot it along the boards in the offensive zone someone tipped it in front and it went in like okay right like that's not very projectable right like that could be anybody um I think there was one where he was in his own end and on an empty net scenario and I think he just passed it to his defense partner in his own end who then carried it all the way and they scored a goal and it was a it was an assist for him and it's like well yeah of course he's gonna you know great cool um so I think that that did you know sell him to people very early uh, and I think there's a lot of inertia to avoid bumping him down a ton, especially because people then looked at him and saw how good of a skater he was for how big he is. And it's very difficult to convince people that something rare like that is not worth just taking a swing on. Um, and he's like, you know, like AJ saw, he's not bad, but I just think that the, 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 the where he was and continues to kind of be is a little bit, a little bit rich for my taste. Uh, I like this question. Have you ever th- have you ever looked at working in the NHL? I mean, yeah. If an NHL team <laughs> called me, I'm not saying no. Uh, I, I and I look. I'm not the kind of person who needs to be the guy who everybody listens to immediately, right? Like I know, like I'll be. You can lock you can lock me in the basement and throw the key in the garbage with a computer and just let me go for ten hours a day. I'll do it. I'll do it. Right? Like if even if you don't listen to me, but I won't forget about if I was correct on things, but you, you will, you can bet your bottom dollar. I won't put up a fight um, because I just want to learn, right? Like my whole thing about all of this over the years has been just learning. I never played hockey at a high level, but I certainly pay attention to it. I try to study it. I love to study just the mechanics of games. I'm a big board game guy. Um, I'm super into that stuff. And so to understand as much as I can about hockey and how, athletes develop and you know like i have a bachelor of science in kinesiology so you know i kind of have some level of background in like the body and and development and all this stuff um so it's always really interesting to me and i i mean yeah like the person goes on to say that i've had some good calls over the years and i've had some bad calls as well you know we can be honest but you know of course like if the phone rings i'm not saying no you know i i'm trying to carve my own path i'm i'm a very entrepreneurial person as well Um, but I will set that all aside if it, you know, like I, my whole goal from the beginning has been, uh, has been, I need to, you know, I would like to take this as far as I can. If I, if I can set the goal for myself of somehow bringing home a Stanley cup or a ring or something or helping a team get there, I'll do it. I would not say no. Um, but it hasn't happened yet. Right. Like, and there's a number of reasons as fast as possible. Well, that too, (laughs) that too. Yeah. That, that I I wasn't going to say that, but that's in there too. Um, the best goal scorer of the year, not just a shooter, Iserman, Catton, or Celebrini. I would say Celebrini. Celebrini just brings so much goodness to the table. Um, it, I think that's an easy one. I, Iserman, it's very much raw shooting ability. Catton, I do not understand how he scored 50 goals this year, to be perfectly honest. I don't get it. Um, but Celebrini, I think, is the choice there easily. Uh, early steal of the 2023 draft or guys that should have gone earlier. I, so I see that the producer has put some of his own, Mm -hmm. uh, Bradley Nadeau is one that I'm putting in there. He's had a great year with Maine, uh, when I've seen them this year, him and his brother, just bringing Maine back to the forefront. I believe Maine is in the NCAA tournament, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, Easton Cowan, I think has had a really good year. I still, you know, I still think there are other guys I would take higher, but he definitely has shown that the people who gasped at the draft when he was drafted Mm -hmm. might be incorrect a little bit um but you know he i think he's looking good as a as a guy that can play down an nhl lineup uh carson rakoff is another one i wanted to bring up uh he seems to really have sort of captured the skill and creativity that he saw that i saw like here and there when i watched him and he's had a great year i think he's a big reason why kitchener has been doing so well um the other ones i'm throwing out zach benson i think should have been a top 10 pick i think that day one you could have probably brought that up but He's looked pretty good in the Sabres uniform. And down the board, I'd say Oscar Fisker Molgard. He had a bit of a slow start to the year, but he has really turned things around. Um, had a great back half of the year with HV71. Um, played really, really well. Uh, you know, just again, a really smart up and down the ice kind of guy. 
who I really liked last year and was drafted too late. And AJ, you put two names in here, so I'll yes, let you I go did. through these I put two. Gavin go nuts Ridley because he's awesome. <laughs> Good for the brand on brand. Yeah. Oh yeah, he just he just rocks, and we saw what he did at the World Juniors. He was phenomenal. He was up there. I think he was the second highest goal scorer at that I think tournament, so, yeah. but he led it for a good chunk of time. Yep. And he just didn't get drafted super high because he's small. So whatever. Uh, I love him. And uh, I took him with my Seattle pick and I'm not regretting it. But the guy I really wanted with my Seattle pick went a pick before I went to to take my selection. That's Oliver Moore. And I, I, I just really adore Oliver Moore's game. Super Another guy who... And, yeah. He was another guy who had a bit of a slow start to the year as well. Um, I think after the World Juniors, he kind of just took off. And I think he's the second leading scorer on Minnesota now. Um, and they're going into the, into the NCAA tournament. So, yeah, I, I would agree those two as well. Um, yeah. Yep. If you had to bet on one player to have a better NHL career than Macklin Celebrini, who would it be? I think Ivan Demidov. Uh, I, I don't know. I could see a world where Demidov is just filling hockey nets uh all season long uh especially uh from a playmaking standpoint um yeah i i would say demidov would be that guy yeah i'm with that because i watched him a bit last year too because we were talking yeah. about him in comparison to mitchkov and we were thinking at the like i think at least i was thinking at the time that he might have been better and i don't know where i stand on that anymore because i'd still have to go back and watch what's what what's out there now but right yeah it could very well be demidov he's gross yeah <laughs> yeah i don't know who else i would put like i don't think berkeley i think berkeley Catton could be comparable and i think caden lindstrom could be comparable but i think if everything goes right for ivan demidov we look back and we're like this guy went second or third or fourth overall like yeah every team would love to have a guy as skilled and creative as an ivan demidov uh update on your boy lucas gustafson yeah lucas gustafson is still in college uh he's been boxed out of the lineup a little bit for boston college um some defensemen are playing a little bit more than him uh for sure um but he, i thought he had a pretty good year all things considered um you know i thought aaron mededian also had a really good year on that team a guy who i liked last year as well um but gustafson you know yeah like he's he was gonna be a guy that needed time to develop and sort of find out what he's going to be. Um, you know, the skill is still there. I've been checking in on him once in a while with Boston college. The skills definitely still there. Um, and I think he's just sort of refining and figuring out what he's going to be at the next level. Like he can't be the high puck possession, you know, skill first guy that he always kind of has been. It's just a matter, you know, and it's a, it's kind of the risk with these guys who lean so offensively and want to play so much offense. Um, you know, when that dries up there, there's, there's often issues that come out and I think he's just kind of working through it and, you know, NCAA free agent at some point I could see. Um, and when Boston college loses a bunch of guys, uh, to the NHL, which I think they will in short order, uh, I imagine he'll play more minutes and we'll see what happens then. Um, where else? Oh, I lost my spot. There we are. Uh, who should Pittsburgh draft if we get a top 10 pick? Yeah, <laughs> um, I saw what you wrote there and I, yeah, I had to mute we myself don't need to. I started laughing. <laughs> <laughs> um, who should Pittsburgh draft in the top 10? Well, you've got Kyle Dubas running the show. I'll probably be uh, like a cat. I could see. Yeah. That. I could see Berkeley cat and, Archem Levshinov comes to mind as well, just because he seems like a really good person and Kyle Dubas loves to draft good people. Yeah, but is he going to be there? Because I don't think Pittsburgh is that far Depends down on how, but I, yeah, it depends. Depends. He probably won't be there though. You're right. Like if I look at Zeev Booyam, like Zeev Booyam might be a guy. Yeah, that, that's possible. Like if I go to take a thon now, just to see where everybody currently would be, I'm going to sim the lottery just in case. Okay. So New Jersey moves up 10 spots. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know that was possible anymore. They move up to second. Mm. But uh, so let's say Pittsburgh drafts because right now they're around 11 or 12 spot. Right. So Berkeley Catton's possible, I think. And then you can throw out some names because you're more knowledgeable of the guys that should be there. Yeah. I mean, Zeev Booyam could be there. 
he could be a good one for for Pittsburgh to pick up. I think he would fit there. Um, uh, yeah, maybe like a Liam Green tree. It depends on what they want. It's weird. Like with how they drafted last year, it was kind of a mix of. They also drafted some pretty decently smart guys like a Braden Jaeger, um, Zamplant, another sort of decently smart guy. Zeev Buyam, maybe then, I would say, could be the guy. Mm -hmm. It's possible. Especially if it's not Berkeley Catton. Uh, if you were the GM of a cup contending team, who would you reasonably hope was available at 32? Alphonse Frey, probably. Absolutely. Like if I'm a Stanley Cup, if I'm a Stanley Cup winning team and I can add an offensive defenseman that plays like Alphonse Frey with the the skating ability and the 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 manipulation and the skill level and the everything, like yeah, I'll take a chance on him and yeah, I think it's, it's be about as good a bet as well. Too. Yeah, like he just yeah, he moves well enough that he can definitely do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which 2024 prospect has fallen the most for me since the start of the year? Um, I mean, I'll throw Sam Dickinson out there, but only because I saw what I, I loved what I saw of him last year with like the mobility and the confidence and, you know, hard, crisp passes and everything. And I just haven't seen that out of him this year, which is so weird. Um, like I know I hear Sam McGilligan in my head talking about, london and how blah 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 <laughs> but i just i watched another game of him yesterday morning and it's more of the same that i've seen all year where i'm going i don't know what kind of system london plays but it certainly doesn't make sam dickinson look particularly good right like when you're talking about uh why maybe the first defenseman to go off the board right like i i, I don't know Right, like, am I am I okay with a player who is soft defensively on on retrievals? A guy who does not always see the ice super well, and like the number of times in that game where I saw him have options along the boards for an easy breakout and just flip the puck to center ice, and guys were just coming back the other way. It's like I don't know if that's London's system. It's just get it out of our own end and then play hard off puck and get there, like sure that i terrified guess of a four check <laughs> i don't know like it's very weird and then out of a nowhere he'll put the puck on his stick and go turbo so but that doesn't happen very often for me and that that's very strange to me and the numbers behind him are mixed i would say um it's weird he's a very weird one uh lucas patterson i think is though the one that i would say probably answers the question the best. I loved him at the beginning of the year. I thought early in the year he, you know, he was frustrating. Uh, but I think there was, I thought there was a lot of potential and I still do. Um, but it's just those frustrating moments are like really often. Um, it's, it's like for me with Pedersen, it's, you know, he's fast and skilled and times his passes really well, but he's very much like invisible off the puck. He, his pressure application is really soft. He's a weak stick checker. Um, you know, he, he plays with the puck on his stick, but only pretty much plays with the puck on his stick. Like he's very much a give me the puck and I'll worry about it type guy without really being able to have the talent to just sort of take over a shift just yet. Um, and his offensive ability just like really comes and goes. I know he scored a lot of points, but I, I, I predicted this, uh, in my draft ranking about him where, you know, he was about a point a game and then Moto went to the bottom 10 of the under 20 league where they only play the bottom 10 teams in the league. And then his scoring sort of took off. Like he can take advantage of, of bad players. Um, but it's just going to be a matter of like the rest of the picture for him and, like to me, it's like he's he's one of those guys where if I'm drafting him, the talk is you could be as good as you want to be, but you're gonna need to put in the work. And if you don't, it's you're gonna get eaten alive, right? Like there's potential, but it's not, you know, it I, I it's it's been frustrating because there's the potential, but not quite the results you want. <laughs> Uh, is it crazy to think that Alphonse Frey might be the best defenseman of the draft? Where do you have him? I mean, I have him at five, <laughs> <laughs> like, but that's honestly like, I don't know if I believe that, but it's really like, I keep 
leaving him in the same spot because I don't see a reason to bump him down when I watch him. And then I watch other players and I'm going, I kind of like this guy more than this guy. Like I kind of like Frey more than this player. I kind of like Frey more than this guy. And, and they all just one at a time, just keep falling behind him. And then I go back and watch him again. And I'm going, I, I like, I like this guy a lot. I like this Alphonse Frey dude a lot. Um, and I just leave him where he is. So for me, it's right now he's ended up at five. Uh, I did watch a game of Trevor Connolly today where he played really well, but yeah, again, like Alphonse Frey plays a really good example of what I think a modern offensive defenseman needs to do and be effective in that role, like a really effective one. And like you, like AJ, you said, like it, that, and that doesn't mean he's not going to be a good defender. Yeah. It's just a matter of he has the footwork and he has the mobility to play defensively right like and also i do agree that i think we talked about this when we went over him but like i agree totally that him being on the right side of the ice while being a left hand shot all season long every game i've seen him he's playing that position that makes his life more difficult so if he were playing on his strong side on the left side of the ice he probably would have it even easier to do kind of what he wants to do so i am very curious about him long term uh, and yeah, I keep moving other guys below him. I don't know. It's weird. Thoughts on Dalibor Dvorsky and Theo Lindstein. Lindstein's looked really solid this year. Yeah, so uh, Lindstein has had a pretty good year. I've seen him here and there. Um, again, always a guy who I thought projected more as like a safe and dependable defense first guy. And I think he's done that job quite well this year. Um, Dvorsky, I mean... Yeah, I mean he you it's it, it's I've said this a million times, but I don't have any doubt about Dvorsky's ability to produce against junior competition. He's bigger, he's stronger than a lot of them, he's a better shooter than a lot of them. Like there there's a lot of things Dvorsky does better than a lot of junior players that yeah, he can score points. Sudbury got a huge boost when he showed up. Like I'm not, you know, he's not a bad player against younger competition, but I think that watching him in the SHL this year and going back to watching him in Hockey El Svenskan last year, you know, like, why was he having so many issues getting ice time in Sweden and a guy like Oscar fisker Mulgard just got better and better and better over the year? Yes, you can blame maybe the coaches for not giving him a lot of ice time and Oscar's Ham maybe not being the best team around him, but I'm pretty sure HV71 was also up for elimination and fisker Mulgard went like two rounds later um, and he just got better and better. So to me with Dvorsky, it's it's more of like a when you take the context all together, like you saw a lot more of those issues where I think it mattered more. You know, like Dvorsky played against men most of last season. So you would think that going back to juniors, yeah, he's got the experience of playing against better physical players. He wasn't particularly great, but he did it. So when he goes back to juniors, yeah, he should be scoring, right? Like if he went back to junior and he wasn't scoring points, you know, and that would be really troubling, right? Like David Reinbacher, he didn't have the best season over in Switzerland this year. And if he left halfway through the year and went to Sarnia and wasn't great there either, then yeah, that's troubling. But I would certainly not expect that. I would expect him to be a really good defenseman in the OHL because he's been playing against men for parts of the last three years. So anyway, I still feel the same about Dvorsky, I guess is what I'm saying. Like a bit of a limited upside guy offensively, big and strong could be a thing i guess uh but yeah middle of i don't the know what kind of guy middle of the lineup yeah sure yeah i was right. never super impressed with him last year yeah i just yeah. came away with the feeling i get with a lot of guys when i'm watching which is eh. and he's fine he'll play it's just i wouldn't have taken him where they took him yeah it was like 10th overall or something like that's that was a yeah. little nutty to me especially with like zach benson on the board right like that Zach, uh, easy pick for me is Zach Benson over a guy like Dvorsky. Easy. Uh, anyway, who is Emmett Finney, who the Red Wings just signed? And why are you, why are all of you mean to AJ? He needs a raise. Well, if we had are more subscribers, I, I don't, could, re I don't think I don't know. Being mean to me. Maybe I, I don't me. mind it. Maybe me and Sam. People have been but, mean to me my whole life, man. It, uh, this is, this hey, is child's play. We all dish it. We can all take it. We, exactly. We make fun of each other all the time uh bring on the hate you know, i don't care yeah we bully we bully each other all the time uh but who is emmett finney that's a great question because i barely know i know he's had a pretty good year in cam loops um i was in a when he got signed i got a, a message from someone 
in in the NHL who was like, I don't think Red Wings fans have ever watched Emmett Finney actually play hockey. Or no, it was I don't think the Red Wings have ever watched Emmett Finney play hockey. <laughs> and so that might that might give you a, an indication of what some people might think about him. Um, I did see a bit of him last year after the Red Wings drafted him, and I did not think there was much there uh, with him. I don't really even know what to tell you about him. Uh, so I'll punt that one. Uh, what prospects development journey has been your favorite to watch over the years? That is an extremely Josh good Wall, question. Doesn't it? It has to be. I mean, that's been fascinating. Um, that's definitely been fascinating. I'm trying to think of like going back further. I think William Eklund has been very interesting. Um, mostly because he's facing a little bit more roadblocks than I was expecting. Um, but when I reflect back on what I remember from when he was a draft eligible, I can kind of see why. Uh, but I mean, between him and all the other guys in the draft that are playing in the NHL, like n- not a lot of them are like really going like gangbusters, right? Like the is having a off what? Except Logan. Yeah. Logan Stankoven. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, Brant Clark is, I guess, finding his footing in the NHL right now. Simon Edmondson is sort of up and down, but not a full-time NHLer. Ken Johnson is fine, but not really like a, you know, what what people thought he was going to be yet. Luke Hughes has been good uh, for sure. He's a solid NHL player now. Mason McTavish, a solid NHL player. I think a pretty good power forward. Uh, Matty Beneers is having an off year, but I still believe that that guy is going to bounce back because I have to believe that. Uh, Owen Power is Owen Power. Like he's working out, um, you know, he's fine. Um, But like, the rest of them, like it's, it, they're all still kind of a mixed bag. So for William Eklund to still be sort of finding his footing uh, on a team that seems to be going a direction away from players like him, I think is 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 somewhat reasonable and and ex- and acceptable. But he's been interesting just from a studying hockey perspective of of what players like him, you know, could turn out to look like in the NHL. And that class is just early. getting their foot in the door in a lot yes. of ways. I, I'm still waiting yep. to see my boy get his opportunity and i think he will next year and i think he's gonna yep. be really good and that that boy being fabian i sell because yep. i love him but we're still at the beginning of these guys entering the nhl and i'm excited to see it mm-hmm. agreed um okay uh well i mean that's that's it for the the pre-planned questions from before the show i believe um, we did get a couple of questions about, uh, NCAA and CHL, uh, playoff brackets and everything. Mm-hmm. So obviously I'm not, we're not going to do a whole bracket of all of these. Um, but people did ask to know, <laughs> yeah, I know like a few, and a, but I think there's going to be a few really good series, uh, in the CHL playoffs and in the NCAA, uh, let me open the NCAA bracket actually. Cause the NCAA is probably the easier one to go over really quick. Oh, the tournament's already started. Denver's playing mass and already up one, nothing. Um, I think Denver's going to win that game. I don't know. I watched Mass a couple of times in their regional tournament. Honestly, I hate to say it. Michael Hrabel, again, almost... Oh, it's 1-1 now. I spoke too soon. Um, But Michael Hrabel just was not good enough in a playoff scenario, again, against Boston College, I believe it was. I keep mixing them up in my head. I shouldn't, but I do. Um, But yeah, he... And that's like a trend for him. So I get the feeling Denver's going to take that one. I'd be surprised if Maine lost to Cornell. I'd be very surprised if Boston College didn't beat any of Michigan Tech, Wisconsin, or Quinnipiac. Uh, I still think Quinnipiac has a chance, but they're going up against Boston College if they beat Wisconsin. And I think they could beat Wisconsin, but Boston College is going to be tough. Um, Michigan State, I feel like, is going to win their game. But North Dakota, Michigan, I think is going to be a great one. I give the edge to Michigan, but North Dakota also has a pretty good team this year. I would be shocked if Boston U lost to to RIT, RIT, the Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, and Minnesota's playing Omaha, Nebraska, and I feel like I'd be surprised if Minnesota lost that game too. So from there, I I would get I would put my money on like I don't know Boston University with Jacob Fowler in net making it to play against. Michigan or Michigan, I guess, or Michigan state, sorry. And maybe I would take Boston university over Michigan state. Um, 
Denver, I think, beats Maine, but I wouldn't count Maine out of it. Um, and my upset, I say, I don't know, maybe Quinnipiac takes down Boston College. I don't know. Uh, and and I don't know, because I also said Quinnipiac could go pretty deep this year because they've got a pretty good team of of older, more experienced veteran guys. And so if you, if you subscribe to that being important, then great. Um, but in the CHL, uh, I mean, Saskatoon PA, I think Saskatoon's taken that one. Swift Current Lethbridge, I think Swift Current should win that one. Moose Jaw probably beats Brandon. I'd be shocked if they didn't. Medicine Hat Red Deer, I think could be an interesting one, but I give the edge to Med Hat. Uh, Prince George over Spokane, I think would be a good one as well. Um, but again, Prince George, I think gets the advantage on that one. Uh, Portland, Victoria, that one should go to Portland. Everett, Vancouver should go to Everett. Wenatchee, Kelowna, I think will be decent, but I think it leans Wenatchee. And also I want to see Kenta Isagai win another championship because he won one last year and needs to win another one. Uh, Oshawa should beat Barry. North Bay should beat Kingston, I'd say, but that could be a close one. Brantford should beat Ottawa. Uh, Sudbury, I think, could beat Mississauga. Uh, London probably will beat Flint. Saginaw should beat Owen Sound. The Sioux should beat Guelph. And Kitchener should beat Erie. Like Those ones are pretty straightforward to me, generally. Um, in the Quebec, I honestly have not seen enough of Quebec to really know, uh, but by Como should be Charlottetown. I would put my money on Halifax over Acadie Bathurst. Um, Moncton Chicoutimi could be interesting. Um, I'd say Ramuski could get past Cape Breton. Um, Drummondville and St. John, I'd give to Drummondville. Rue Naranda, Gatineau, honestly, I don't know. I don't think I've seen either of those teams. Actually, that's not true. I watched Jan Golicic a few times, who I believe is on Rune Naranda. I don't know. Um, Victoriaville, Shawinigan, Sherbrooke, Planville, Barbrion. I, it's not my area of expertise. Why don't you just I'll pick say the winner? That. Why don't you just pick the winner of each and then pick yeah, okay. the winner? Yeah, well, the, okay. So let's go Moose Jaw in the West. Uh, Saginaw in uh, Ontario and mm, from what I've seen in Quebec Halifax maybe sure Jordan Dumay QMJHL champion champion <laughs> let's let's go there um all right so that that does it for that so we can ignore all the NCAA questions probably in the chat and we'll just pop over to the chat for the rest of the show uh let's see what we got He's here winning the mem. The, Memorial the Mem Cup? Cup? Yep. Hmm. Maybe Moose Jaw. Moose Jaw comes to mind. Okay. I, I really like the Warriors. Really like Moose Jaw this year. Uh, Portland. If Portland can also work their way up, I, I like the Portland Winterhawks this year too. Well, you but, know it's going to be a Quebec team, so you got to pick the. Quebec yeah, of course. Team. It's gonna be. It's gonna be like by Como or something. Blanville, <laughs> Bois Brion. I don't know. But yeah, Quebec's the greatest, so they're gonna win. Um. Okay. Yeah, let's go Denver. College hockey all day. That's true. There's a lot of college hockey today. Before we get to uh, the end of, yeah. or the beginning of the chat, uh, Rayanne donated. So, uh, oh, we go over his question. Oh, first cool. Because thoughts on we Ethan bribes. McKenzie. Yeah, we do take bribes. Of course, we take bribes. It's 2024. If you're not taking bribes, you're not living. Uh, Ethan McKenzie, I don't know who this person is. So, Ray, I'll take a look and give you a nice little, uh, nice little, little thing in a, in a bit but thanks for the donation. <laughs> I, I can't answer your question, but thank you. Um, to be answered later. <laughs> yeah. And I will. He'll keep me to it. I feel like he'll keep me to it. Um, thoughts on what the Predators are doing right now and how does their prospect pool look? I mean, it's incredible what they're doing. I, I don't know how else to put it. Um, it's Preds. pretty incredible. It's, it's incredible. Um, where's Nashville on my list here? Um, Oh God! I just have to Google it. Okay, there. No, no. Control F. Control F. Uh, yeah, Nashville. So their prospect pool. I mean, I love what they're doing in the NHL. I think their prospect pool looks decent. Again, like I can nitpick here and there where they should have gone in a different direction. Maybe if it were me, guys like Kamel. I think Kamel's had a decent year, a good year in the AHL this year. But I think there are were better options. Um, Zach LaRue has been quite good for what he does in the, in the AHL. Fyodor Svechkov is having a good bounce back season, um, after a bit of a tough, tough career in Russia. Um, Tanner Molendyke has had a really good year as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's a lot to like with these guys. Austin Roast has had a good year and I've liked him when I've seen him. 
but yeah, I mean, this is a team where if I look under the hood and, and sort of pick around and poke around, there's some areas where I probably would have gone in a different direction, but they're probably a playoff team this year. So who cares? Um, they're, they're doing just fine. Something's going right there. Uh, where did you have Dvorsky ranked last year and has your opinion changed since he moved to the OHL? So my opinion has not changed. I think I had him at like, Oh God, I don't remember. Um, I don't eight, think it was first? in the first round. Okay. I don't think it was first round. Uh, let's see. Because again, like I, I have been over it a bunch of times with him. Um, just not a, like, I'm not surprised he's scoring, you know, I think you have but, him in the thirties thereabouts. Probably. Let's see. Um, Dvorsky. I had him at... Where is he? he? I lost him. There he is. I have him at 36. Which... I don't... I still kind of stand by that. Um, yeah. But in any case... I don't disagree uh, with that. Yeah. I'm thinking, oh my god, I'm thinking it's your turn at the Zach Hyman discourse. Oh my god, oh no. I mean, I tweeted out what I thought, right? Uh, which was a, the video from Bo Burnham's Inside where he's sitting there and doing a monologue about how people are just not capable of just shutting up. And like, that goes for everybody. Like, like some people were like taking multiple shots at andrew berkshire like for multiple days in a row and it's like like we get it right like it was a it's a bad take objectively like it's bad a lot of people already know the story he's alluding to and a lot of people don't really care like newsflash life is unfair and people with power and money are able to do things that people without power and money can do that's been true since the babylonian era like that's that's been true since hammurabi did the whole eye for an eye thing and the epic of Gilgamesh was, was on the bookshelves, right? Like that's just how <laughs> life is. Like that's, that's just how that's it how is, far man. Like, back you're going. Yeah. Cause it's true. It is true. Like people with the land and people with the power, they're the ones who get away with stuff and well, it's just by how it is. Divine right to rule. Or that. Yeah, exactly. And so it's like, okay. Yeah. And so with Zach Hyman, like, and also he's a 30 something year old man. 31. Like it's, it's not like it's not like he's a, 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 a an 18 year old right and you know it's like it doesn't it makes no difference what his dad did when he was 16 or 15 or 14 like it makes no difference so whatever it's a bad take and i think he's like dub not doubled down but like been online per per like forever trying to defend himself and it's like man i don't know what you're trying to do but just eat your like, crap sandwich yeah just just take the crap sandwich and move on but he is but i will say the crap sandwich he's getting is out of control like i i've seen people just i don't know like a bad take is a bad take but i've i don't know i think it's a little bit out of it's just like people it's a lot of people who i think have trouble with how people treat people on the internet and complain about bullying and and how they treat people and then they are all just piling on this guy or people who say i'm not a bully i'm not you know they, they're they're a little bit more combative and reactionary online and they're like but they're they try not they say they're not or trying not to be and they just whatever but then they turn out like when something like this happens it's like red meat and it's just they go nuts i i, I don't know my whole thing is like people just talk too much like it's people are online too much and it just like rots your brain and like i don't know and i guess the irony of what i'm saying about like i don't know touch grass is like ironically as andrew berkshire was touching grass in that video uh i at least i think he was but anyway it it's I don't know. I just, I just saw that and went, Oh God. And then I saw the reaction. I went, Oh God. And it just, I just kind of left it alone. Uh, out of Demidov, Lindstrom and Catton, which one of them do you think will fit the Habs the best? Honestly, probably Lindstrom. Uh, I would, I, if the Montreal Canadians could have are in the potential situation where Matvey Mitchkov and Ivan Demidov could be on the same team with Cole Caulfield <laughs> And they said no twice, I think would be hilarious. But answering the question honestly, I would say Caden Lindstrom. I think that makes the most sense. I was on the Centennial podcast and pitched him as a senator as well. I just think he fits kind of what they're looking for in a player a lot and what they kind of could use more of. Um, so, yeah. 
Yeah, Montreal See, can now use good centers. Yes. Uh, now David Phillips is here, dropping names, and I now will not trust anything he says with regards to names, because uh, we said he should try to trick us. And so now I don't know if any of these names are real. So I'm going to assume, because it sounds like a real name, Bogdan Lebedev is a real person. And he is. <laughs> Bogdan Lebedev of uh, Locomotive of Local 64. Oh, well, um, that, that takes away the fun. You have to just... Uh, that's true. It does. Uh, but I don't know. I've, nev I, I've never seen... How many times David gets you. Yeah, exactly. I've never seen Bogdan Lebedev um so i'll check him out and again like ray i'll give you a, i'll give you the update in discord buddy uh sticking with the draft in the late first early second who are you banging the table for uh ray probably absolutely um thoughts on ivan Coliata, one of the lowest ranks goalies on my list i'm trying to think if that's a word joke i i also 110 goalies on your ranking you sir are deranged that's out of control uh, but I'm sure if he's, I'm sure if you have him at 110 on your list, he probably stinks. Uh, <laughs> thoughts on Lawrence Zinedine. I, I, that, that I don't believe is a real name. I think Lawrence Zinedine is a fake name. Uh, can you give your take on Linus Erickson? Uh, really? Again, another really smart guy, good skater gets up and down the ice really well. Um, doesn't get the chance to push a lot of offense but boy howdy is he very smart very dependable at both ends a really good line like line anchor who can sort of link guys together and make smart plays and there's lots to like with him like as a second guy you're drafting uh i, I think that's perfectly acceptable um what's stopping zeve booyam from going second overall his ncaa pr production is generational and there's no superstars after one um booyam is just he relies a lot on smarts um and timing and i think that the skating ability is not really what you need for a high high-end offensive player um i think he gets a lot of his offense from volume and and shooting more than anything um i really like him i want him to work out i think he's just going to need some time to develop and i think with other guys i mean booyam's not that far back from two for me i think he's at six um i just see I got, like you could say the same thing about Ivan Demidov, right? Like his production at his level is also generational um, for, especially for a guy, his age, um, even Berkeley Catton, right? Like a hundred and however many points, 118 points is extremely good, but not necessarily what you would call generational, I suppose. Um, but with Booyam, it's also a lot of it is power play production, which is also something you have to note. Um, so yeah, I have my doubts about Booyam, but long-term, I think there's something really positive. Uh, the West seems wide open. Who do you have making a big run in the playoffs? Ooh. Uh, so in the West, what we're looking at right now is uh, a Dallas-Vegas series, I would say, probably. Vancouver, Nashville, uh, Colorado, Winnipeg, and then Edmonton, LA. I mean, I still like Edmonton, but Colorado, I think, is just making, like, the saying of, like, they're getting hot at the right time, I think is is acceptable for them, and I would throw Colorado out there. Uh but I wouldn't count out Dallas. I know I'm saying every other team, but if I had to come down on one, I'd probably say Colorado. Uh, AJ, who? What? What about you? Um, I'm between Colorado and Edmonton. I think I think we're gonna see a rematch of that uh, of the semifinal, and I believe it was 2022. Yeah. So I don't right. I don't know who I favor out of those two teams. Probably a Colorado, but I could I could easily see Edmonton going on a run i think it's really going to depend on how well Stu skinner plays because yep. there are some nights where he's perfectly solid good goalie and there are other nights where he is really rough so it's going to depend on how well he plays i think how far they'll go because they've got a good team in front of him it's just can he keep his composure and not let puck go past him right um yeah i agree with that Who's the player you most want to see on another team? William Nylander. Easy. Easy question. What? Easy peasy. What? Excuse <laughs> you. Uh, no, I I'm quit. Just kidding. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, though, I probably would throw Clayton Keller out there. Like, really? not because I don't, I don't want to see him not on Arizona, but I want to see him in a big market because he's a big market guy. Like, he, he has, like, that 
electric quality to him that I think being in Arizona has just muted him so much. I thought the all-star game was a great display of that. I'm more interested to just see what he would look like on a team with a bigger platform. Um, maybe Matthew Barzal as well, but he's like, I don't know who, I think who, who you got. Um, just the first one that comes to mind is Nick Ehlers only because I want to see him play oh, a yeah. higher, like I want to see him play higher up the lineup in an increased role. Like yeah. he's, they've brought in more forwards and they give more for other, like the newer forwards time on the power play instead of him. Right. Like he just never seems to get the top line deployment, top power play deployment that he should get. And yeah. that that's why I think he looks great in Winnipeg and, I, I love him there. It's just I wish he'd play higher up the lineup. So for that reason alone, I would like to see Nick Ehlers on another team. But I'm not opposed to him staying on the Jets so long as he gets played up a little more. Because I really yeah, do they, like Nick Ehlers. And just win a Stanley Cup and all is well. Uh, it's opening day. Oh, yeah, it is. MLB opening day, Major League Baseball. Cool. I don't know much about baseball, but I know the rules, I suppose, except the <laughs> infield fly rule. I do not understand the infield fly rule, but we can move on. Uh, do you think the Blue Jays with um, like when you've got a guy on first, right? And there's another guy who hits it into the infield. One of those guys is going to be out because you have to tag up before like the ball kind of has to like drop into play right. before you can actually like give them an out. So, there's a guy running to first base and when you have two guys on the same base, I think they're both automatically out if I'm not mistaken. So yep. essentially, I don't know. no matter what, one of those guys is getting out. That's how I think it works. I could be wrong, but okay. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. It just deals with two guys on first base, one guy having to run there and the other guy having to wait for the ball to drop before he can advance to second. So one of them is going to be out no matter what. Gotcha. Um, do I think the Blue Jays have enough to make the playoffs? I mean, it's a 50-50 shot for me, but I mean, I guess not because fewer teams make the playoffs in baseball. So I'm going to say no because it all almost always is no. Um, and I also, from what I gather from the Blue Jays fans that I know, is that everybody hates how things have been going. Mm -hmm. So no, but... Also, I don't know anything about baseball, really. I feel like really. the team got worse, potentially. Like, where they didn't mm. do much, right? Like, their pitching is great still. And, like, they were a really high-end rotation last year. But you got to see a huge step out of Vladdy again. Like, he's got to get back to close to MVP range in order for this team to really, like, take off again. Because trading for Varsho and getting rid of Gabby Moreno, who is now the three-hitter, on Arizona, who just made the World Series. Oh, and yeah. Losing Guriel Jr. as well. Like, you know, they gave up a lot to get Varsho, and he's been a no-show, as I like to say. I like that. So yeah. I, I'm not confident. Not confident. Yeah. Yeah. He could be, Varsho could be better, but you definitely lost that trade. Yeah. Is Toronto one of those analytics teams? I don't know. Are the Blue Jays kind of known as like one of those nerds? Well, they, uh, who was it that they pulled? They pulled, I think it was Burrios oh, yeah. in the middle of yeah, a, yeah, yeah. a good quality yeah. start in the playoffs. And then they just got so They're nerds-ish. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. not confident in their ability to make the playoffs. And if they do, it'll be... Uh, oh, and six, I think. <laughs> Rip. In, in the last three years or three or four years, whatever it's been. Big, sad, big, sad. Um, okay. Well, uh, thoughts on Justin Poirier? I mean, I don't think he's projectable to the NHL. He's a guy who loves to skate hard and shoot the puck from everywhere um, in Quebec. I will do another. I've got another game of his lined up, so I'll have better thoughts on him down the road. So if you tune in later or listen to the podcast later, I'm sure it'll come up again and I'll have better thoughts on him. But um, the second game I did of him was better than the first, but I still think he's got a long ways to go. So circle back, come back next week or on Monday yes. and ask the question, and hopefully Will won't uh, won't punch you again. <laughs> won't blow won't blow you off. Yeah. Uh, okay. Do you think that besides Leon Mugli and Denis, Daniil Ustinkov, there is another, or do you think there's another, other Swiss players are going to be drafted? Um, 
it's possible. I mean, there's a couple of Swiss guys that I've liked over the course of the year. Uh, Robin Nico Antonin is one of them who I've liked. I liked him at the Five Nations, and he's interesting. Um, I really like a defenseman who I noticed while watching Leon Mugley uh, in Ludwig Johnson, who his analytics look really good, uh, and he's really skilled. And I, I have another game of his to do. I have to check in on him again. But um, I think there's a lot of potential with Ludwig Johnson as well. Just again, like you leave him in Switzerland for a number of years and hopefully he works his way up the depth chart with Zug. Um, but I really liked him at the under 20 level there, even though he doesn't have a ton of points. Um, but other than that, I haven't seen a ton of Swiss guys that really move the needle a ton for me. But I did do another game of Ustinkov yesterday and he was, it was at the second division and he was just chef's kiss uh but in a boring way in a good boring way he was quite good uh chase hello finally caught one of these in your tracking how often do you find inconsistencies between the data and the eye test players with good numbers who may be good or not so good all the time like i've said this a few times but i've done this now with really intense levels of data tracking and and, and a giant database for this is my fifth draft doing it which is crazy it's my fifth draft doing it but um there are, I mean, every year I get less and less trusting of my data in terms of using it as a, as a, as a projection tool, right? Like obviously having great results on paper generally means that you're having a really, really good game. Um, but it doesn't always, you know, like it doesn't always, especially in a sport like this, it doesn't always mean that you're getting exactly what the player is all about right um so it happens all the time i mean there's tons of guys where they might be really high quality shooters right but they shoot from perimeter areas way too much or they might be um really good playmakers in, on paper in terms of attempting passes into the slot but they're not connecting on any of them so in some ways it looks good but then in reality you're like well yeah but you could just you know I mean, I'd rather have guys throw pucks into the front of the net and see what happens rather than guys who just eat the puck in the corner and turn it over. But there is something to be said about, you know, like, yeah, like you want to be stitching stuff together. But if it doesn't happen for whatever reason, I'm not going to hold that against you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there are situations where it definitely doesn't line up, like, at all, um, especially on things like... Uh, even in single game samples too, right? Like a player could get uh, six pass receptions in the neutral zone in a game, right? Three of them are just, they bounce over the stick, right? It, is it their fault that they don't complete those? No, I don't think so. Is it, you know, so, so I feel like there's other situations where things just don't go their way. Like they go to the net and the puck bounces across the crease and someone has their stick tied to the ice does that mean that they are uh, not performing well? No, they're going to the net. They're going to where you need them to be, but the data shows that they get nothing from doing so, really. Um, so yeah, there's definitely situations where it doesn't really matter. And the older I get, it's more like the data serves as like a spinal cord, you know, but you wouldn't trust a spinal cord to, you know, drive a bus, right? You need the whole person, right? You, you got to... You got to imagine the whole person, but it's nice to have a good backbone. It's good to have a nice foundation to build on uh, to sort of understand what you get, but it doesn't, it's not the be all end all for me at all. And and over the years that gets less and less, uh, a lot of it gets a less and less important for me. Um, thoughts on Liam Greentree. Saw him play last year in Kingston and he looked raw at 16. His draft ranking is about 10 to 21. I have him at um, 12. I think he could be, honestly one of the dark horses to be one of the better players to come out of the draft as a whole just because of how good he is at resisting pressure and making plays under pressure and you know the nhl even if the nhl is fast and physical and intense which it is he can still find ways to make plays in those situations and that's to me quite valuable um and if his skating can improve i think he'll be as good as his skating improves right like he could be uh third line minutes eating guy who is a good possession guy kind of, you know, but, but he could be a guy who really, you know, pushes play really, really well um, is a tough guy to sort of knock off the puck and, and all those good things. Um, and the, the upside, who knows where it could end. 
so yeah I, I like him quite a bit um Oh, the Centennial podcast is actually here. That's nice. Uh, of all the teams that generally finish top of the Atlantic Division, uh, Ottawa, I'm just kidding, huh? Florida, <laughs> Tampa Bay, Boston, and Toronto, whose cup contention window do you believe has the least amount of runway remaining? Tampa. Uh, Tampa, I think. I think. Tampa. Yeah. I think Tampa Boston's and Boston there. are there. Yeah, Tampa and Boston. I think Florida is going to be fine for a little while. Yep. Um, I think Toronto, Toronto I think will be fine for a little while. Runway of all yeah. those teams. Like once John Tavares is gone. Yes. Once John Tavares is gone, they'll the have money to play opens with. Opens up in in a way that. Well, hopefully they can do a lot with, because that's really just the wait, big anchor. Just wait until they spend all that money on some defenseman who they don't really need to spend all the money on. It's gonna be great. Um, if you end up with pick two as the Ducks or Blackhawks, who do you take? Feels like it would be hard to pass on Lindstrom. I mean, as the Ducks or Blackhawks, I've, I mean, it's hard for me to say no to Ivan Demidov, right? Especially with the Ducks. Like the Ducks, I know the Ducks, I don't think the Ducks would pick him. I don't either. The Blackhawks, <laughs> uh, the Blackhawks, I think could. I wouldn't say it's for sure. I don't think the Blackhawks generally draft a lot of Russians, I don't think. Um, the Ducks, I don't think it's a fit. But if it were me, I probably would go Demidov. But for either of those teams, I, yeah, I agree. I think it would be hard to pass on Lindstrom. But for me, I think I would do do Demidov. I could see the Blackhawks going for a defenseman. I could. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Um, who are some of the projected second or third round defenders who you could see having great upside or a great career in the NHL? I mean, Alphonse Frey will go in the second round, yeah, possibly, absolutely. and I'd say him. Uh... I think Dominic Badinka could have a solid NHL career, like a effective, boring, just as good a career as guys drafted a year ahead of him kind of guy. Um, sure. Uh, who else? You mean Stein around, Solberg? Right? Round ahead of him? Uh, yeah. What did I say? Year. <laughs> oh yes. All good. Round. Uh, Solberg and Ustinkov, I'd throw in there as well. Um, guys who probably you could snag a little later, and you know get some good stuff out of them. Um, the home run swing for me is Marcus Kiersey. Like I just watched a game of him again and he had moments where he was awful, but then there were a lot of moments where you go, Oh, okay. Like not many people in the draft do these kinds of things like you do. Um, but then it's also, Oh, there's not many people in the draft who screw this up. Like you do. It's weird. He's a great, he's really interesting, but terrifying. Um, but I've, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still on the Kiersey train. Uh, how can a guy like Button, who is decent to good scout, have Berkeley Cat in fifteenth? Because he's not big. He's a he's a center who doesn't have elite speed, and he's not six two. I think it's as simple as that. Uh, how much do overall totals have you maybe second guessing a player's placement? I don't. I mean, I don't know what you mean by overall totals, I like production. Points. I don't care that much. Like points are just a. Uh, like points are a, re a reward for stuff that is good. But points are not the be all end all. I mean, look at like again, if you if you look at production heavily, go to uh and I don't mean to pick on this guy, but go to Byron Bader's Twitter page and scroll through the images that he posts and look at the comparables. They make no sense. There's nothing there's they they are all over the map, all over the place. Guys who are good, guys who are bad, guys who are terrible, guys who were like okay. It, it, it production doesn't it's it's not a good correlate at all so to me it's about what are they doing on the ice right like what are they doing on the ice and what do i think they can do in the nhl at that level right um and also like looking back like a big thing that i've done over the years is look at the drafts in the past look at the players that have been scoring a lot and don't work out scoring not so much and working out players who were shocking picks at the time who worked out players who were steals later in the draft and have worked out. And what are the common factors between all of those things? You know, like, what is it like the thing I always am questioning is like, people say, Oh, here's a prospect who has a 50% chance of being a star. It's like, I'm not satisfied with that. I don't, I don't want, I, that's not good enough for me. What is he part of that 50%? Like, what is it about that 50% that makes them a star? And what is it about the 50% that they didn't? How do we not answer that question, right? Like, are we happy just saying 
okay, this guy has a probability of being this because of historical precedent, therefore X, right? Like, no, I don't think that's good enough at all. Um, you know, you, you got to go deeper than that for me. So I try to do that. I try to go back in time and go, okay, like pick through these guys and what's special about them. And I saw this guy play, he had 90 points and didn't work out. So what's going on there and blah, 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 blah. So that's, that's, that's just a big, a big part of, 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 of all of that. Um, how good or mature should a player be to get exceptional status in the CHL? Honestly, I cannot answer that. I have no idea. Um, but I, I mean, obviously it should be an extremely high bar and it is for most cases. Um, but I don't really know how else to, to answer that. I don't know. Um, but I mean, it, it, you, I think if you're a 14 or 15 year old kid, you, you need to be really mature. You're likely going to be moving away from home before you're 16. You might be moving a really long way away. You're living with a totally different set of parents. Like are, is the kid even ready or, or going to act properly in a different environment? Um, you know, how can, how will they handle the stress of traveling around some cases like thousands, not a thousands, but lots and lots and lots of kilometers across multiple provinces, a lot and borders. at that age and borders, uh, you know, at 15 years old, like that's a big life change. That's a big one. And I think if I were the difference between, I mean, I'm, tr I'm again, anecdotally remembering the difference between being 15 and 16, but that's a big difference. Like what's one fifteenth in a percentage, right? It's that much longer in your life, right? You're you've lived a, a like 8% more of your life, right? Which is decently significant, right? Like that's not nothing. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's a big change, I think for a kid. So yeah, you gotta be really sure. Uh, I think I was the same doofus at 15 and 16. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> sure. But you know what I mean. I know what you mean. Uh, you get older, right? Like you, you, you do. You know, I was doing stuff at fifteen that at sixteen I definitely was or wasn't doing stuff at fifteen that I was definitely doing at sixteen and seventeen, uh, just because of everyone around me maturing or whatever. So who knows? Oh, that's fair. Uh, Herman Truff is the best defensive forward in the twenty twenty four draft. It's not a terrible take uh, at all. It's made worse by David because it's David, but yeah, he's he's on the Herman Truff train. How can we knock European players sometimes for being unable to be really good in the men's European leagues? Yet we know CHL players, maybe NCAA players might struggle as much playing against men. Bias. That's Isn't it also because it, we see it too. Like we actually yeah, see we them see struggling it. Yeah. against men and yeah. we don't get the like we don't see the guys yeah. who aren't playing against men struggle totally. against men. Yep. Totally. If we saw Agreed. them play against men, we might have the same sort of criticisms, like, but it's just a sample size. And that's why I was so fascinated by the pandemic season when there were some players who didn't even play, but a lot of them went to Europe and played because every year I sit there and go, man, it would be really cool to see what North American players could do against men in Europe. Right. Um, Frank Clark in Slovakia. Yeah. That, that was, was fascinating. Uh, Carson Lambos in Finland. Um, that was very illuminating for me. Mason McTavish in second division, Switzerland. Uh, really interesting stuff and he looked good. and it, I, I, and that was a draft where all the people in the industry were like well it was really hard to scout this year because they weren't playing in our backyard and they you know we could only do video work and this and this and this and i'm sitting there going this is the this is the most interesting draft of all time like just seeing the things that we probably will never see again in terms of where players are playing and what they're exposed to and how they adapt to it i thought it was fascinating and I mean, yeah, like I think you can see certain types of players and why they would struggle on big ice. Right. And why some players on big ice struggle on smaller ice. Right. Like it's part of the reason I, I have a little bit of a concern about um, actually, no, that's not, that's not true. Um, but you can see guys who maybe don't have a lot of pace in their game or not a whole lot of speed in Europe. And you can go, yeah, when the, when the ice gets smaller and the game gets more physical, they'll have less time to think. And I'm not sure how they'll react to that. On the flip side, you have North American players where you're like, these guys don't really have a lot of pace and not a whole lot of skill. And 
they're just kind of safe and dependable and whatever. And then they go to Europe and it's, it's faster than they're used to in Canadian junior hockey. And they get less time to think there and, and they have more ice to play with. Their passes are longer. They have all of this other stuff to consider. And like Carson Lambos did not look ready for Liga hockey whatsoever. And even at the junior level, he looked fine. And I, I don't think I took that into consideration enough. And I did when I, when he was draft eligible, but I remember watching him and going, man, I do not know. And then he went back to the WHL and anyway, we're, we're, we're getting too deep on this, but yeah, I definitely think that they just don't, yeah, they just don't see it. Um, Opinions on Archam Krikunenko. I think that's the guy who's scoring a bunch of points for Locomotive. Uh, I watched him not too long ago and thought he was meh. Uh, thoughts on Jaden Perron's draft season? Um, I mean, I've seen him a few times. And I think that if you look at his stat line, it's a little bit misleading based on how he's played. I thought he's played really well. Um, like, Obviously, an 18-point freshman season is not fantastic, but I've watched him a few times, and I mean, he was always a player with some flaws in his game. Uh, I think that once guys like Jackson Blake leave, um, Cam Berg, maybe one of those guys, I feel like he'll get a bigger role, and I think that'll really help him. Uh, And I think that he's just a player like... He's never been a player that, from what I've seen him, is a guy who it's all about scoring goals. And this season he has 11 goals and seven assists, like the playmaking out of him and the, the ability to thread passes through traffic, I thought was a much stronger thing for him. And it just seems like that's kind of struggling to come along, but I'm not, I'm not scared at all. I think he's, especially for a guy that went 94th overall, like I think you're going to be just fine. All right. So it is four oh one. So now it is time for yeah. rapid fire. Yeah. Rapid fire. Uh, if the sharks lose the lottery and are stuck at two or three, who do you take? Uh, Demidov. Sure. Yep. I mean, Demidov is just so sick. Who's your pick for Gagarin cup. The great Vitaly Kravtsov looking poised to become Gagarin cup champion. Yes. The great Vitaly Kravtsov who has what I don't, the, I don't know. Um, but for KHL champion, um, I need to pull up a bracket. So I'll do that and answer other questions. Um, yeah, uh, v- v- uh, what's his name? Uh, Vitaly Kravtsov, 34 points this year in the KHL in 55 games. Four points in 10 playoff games. He's a legend. Hmm. Um, which player in the NHL would describe as an average NHL player? One defenseman and one forward. I don't know. Who's the most average NHL player you can think of? David uh, Camp. Jack Stadnika. David Camp. Yeah. I think David uh, Camp is the most average NHL player. Yeah, he's extremely player. okay. Def- a defenseman like yeah who would be a defenseman? i don't know I'm trying to think i don't know who'd be the most average defenseman there's so many of them <laughs> like there's just so many guys who are just like fine they just go out and do their job and that's Jake it mccabe <laughs> i'm going all leaves <laughs> yeah um because those are the most average players i could think of on the leaves or maybe like a simon <laughs> benoit another leaf right uh, in the KHL, I probably like, uh, if you don't know, Ska St. Petersburg was eliminated. Um, I really, honestly, I like Spartak, but I've seen Spartak Moscow this year. I think they've looked pretty good. Um, Omsk is also a team that I wouldn't count out at all. Uh, Salavat Yulayev was also eliminated already, which is a surprise. They were, I think one of the best, they were the best goal differential team in their division or their conference, I should say. Um, St. Petersburg was by far the best in the league by 30 goals and they got eliminated. So there's that. Um, that's fun. Oh, I lost one. Uh, there it is. Uh, having watched a fair amount of Czech league this season, I wondered what you thought about Thomas Galvis. Do you project him in the second or third round? Probably. Yeah. I don't think he's a first round pick, but I think he's a first rounder, uh, super skilled, super creative. Um, really, really liked him. Uh, he has some rough patches, definitely some rough spots here and there, but I don't think it's as bad as you would think just looking at how big he is. Um, how amazing has Macklin Celebrini's season been? I know he's no Connor Bedard, but it feels like not enough is being made about how well he is scoring at the freshman level. Yeah, I mean, people are talking about it a lot, so I don't know where that's coming from. But I just think Bedard I, got a ton of coverage because well, he's yes. uh, a god. And, uh, and he also he, he had points on like 65% of his team's goals. He was scoring from everywhere. Like, 
I don't know. Macklin Celebrini also isn't really like the same level of highlight real player. Like he just really is just, I say this to everybody. He's just really good. He's just really good at hockey. Like he just, he can make plays. He can shoot. He can pass. He can chip in physically. He can make plays around the net. He, whatever, very solid he does a lot of things player. well. Very, just very solid hockey player. And that's not as, you know, it's not as sexy as Connor Bedard as scoring a kajillion goals. Generational yeah. talent player. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. He's getting his credit. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think he's getting tons of credit. Uh, most underrated forwards for the next draft. I mean, I think Berkeley Catton is quickly becoming quite underrated. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think Andrew Bash is pretty underrated. I think he's pretty good. Um, Igor Chernyshov played really well in the game that I watched yesterday. Uh, he played really, really well uh, all over the ice. Um, so he might be another one I throw in there, something like that. Oh, yeah, well, now I remembered another one for the underrated in 2023, like who went too late. Oh, yeah. Timur Mukhanov. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was pretty good this year. Uh, mm -hmm. Full-time KHLer, not bad. Pretty good. Also, like one of the younger players in last year's draft, he was like a July kid or something. And Love for a Timur. five for a five eight for a five eight kid, he played pretty well this year when I saw him. Um, thoughts on Darl Zoljanskis? I need to watch him again. I've been procrastinating, circling back on him forever. Um, decent shooter, but I just feel like the rest is a work in progress. Uh, David Phillips, Lawrence Zinedine is very real and he's very much on Omsk. I still don't believe you. I still don't <laughs> believe you. Uh, any thoughts on EJ Emery? For my money, he's the best draft eligible defenseman on the NTDP. I'm not, I'm not huge on EJ Emery. I mean, if you, again, he's another one of these guys who is just very, I like the hot, the style of play with him is very safe and dependable. And I mean this in a not negative way, but like uninspired, like there's just not much there but he's decent at what he does. Like he'll get, it's just the, the recipe for a guy that'll get drafted before I would take him. So is all in the conversation one day, maybe for most average NHL. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right up with the, uh, right up there with like, I don't know. I feel like Calgary has a lot of like just NHL guys, you know, Michael stone. Um, Thoughts on Lisan Al Gaib? Uh, uh, you know what? I'd run into the war zone with Lisan with the Lisan Al Gaib any day. Uh, that speech really got me going uh, when when he uh, when when he was pro pro prophesizing as he did. I'd be terrified to see what he if I stood up and was like, "I challenge you," and what he would do if he pointed at me and read my mind. Um, that would be, I don't I don't know what he would pull up uh, about me, but. I would it so I guess I would I would follow him into the fire and you know what I'd rather be part of the fanatical legions uh cleansing the galaxy than uh being cleansed myself uh for my what's it called cosmopolitan lifestyle. I have Trevor Connolly ranked 13th on my board right now. Do you see him as a top 15 talent in the draft? Yes, I do. That is it. Any love for Leo Celine Melanius? I'm not a huge fan. I'm not a huge fan. I I don't know. I feel like I, I still don't quite understand where his offense projects. Uh, he's a tricky one. Thoughts on Adam Jekko. Whenever I see him, he's either a ghost or decent. I mean, that makes sense. Um, David just DM'd me privately that Lauren Zinedine's elite prospects page, and he just made it. He, I, he absolutely just made it. Um, Is it like uh, whenever I, that the Lebanese-Australian guy, Lemieux, yeah. that they made up? What, what's his name? Oh. So, is it something Mustafa Lemieux. Lemieux. Yeah, Mustafa, Mustafa Lemieux. Lemieux. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Adam Jekko, I mean, is he going to get drafted and pushed into an NHL role at some point as a fourth or third line center? Sure. Can he, can he suck up the puck and just play defense first stuff and once in a while have a few nice moments offensively? Sure. But I don't, I don't see much with, with him, honestly. Um, what do you think explains Panarin's career year at 32? Cause he's friggin' sick. Like, I don't know. He's just really skilled and really sick. Like he's been having great years for years. So scoring as a whole is up. Their power play is pretty good. And he's running the whole thing. Why was Panera not drafted? I believe that that was because he was open about not really wanting to come to North America. I believe that that's what happened. 
Um, mo- in these days, teams generally will just pick the player anyway. I know there's a couple of Russians who said in advance that they didn't want to come to North America or weren't really planning on it, and they fell in the draft. But he was, I think that's what happened with him, but I could be wrong because he was a really good draft eligible. Um, and it was also sort of back in the era where saying something like, I don't want to really come to North America would spook teams off completely. Um, how do you feel about Jesse Polkinen and the trans translatability of his game to the NHL? <laughs> I don't know. Would I take him in the third round and see what happens because there's nobody else like him? Sure. Would I, would I take him at 15th overall? because I think he's awesome. No, I don't think so. Like you have to keep in mind that next fall he'll be 20, which puts him a lot further along than the rest. Um, And I think he gets away with a lot because he's just bigger and protects the puck better than a lot of his competition. I just don't know. I do not. And some of the decisions that he makes also a good NHL team with a good four check, they're going to eat him alive. So we'll see what happens. Uh, thoughts on a uh, person again I don't know Vyacheslav Novoseltsev I don't uh, uh, David you you, you got me uh, Artemi Pleshkov um, that name rings a bell I'm going to google him because I trust this person more than I trust David uh, Artemi you Pleshkov yourself, Will. You, oh you Pleshkov gave, the goalie sorry you gave David instructions to try I did. and basically I did. make you look like a like a fool like a ninny. And now we have a and now, and now we have dealing with the consequences of being exactly. spooked. Exactly. I am. Uh thoughts on Artemi Pleshkov? I mean, a 5'10 goaltender will be a tough sell every single day. Uh, but this, if you don't know, Artemi Pleshkov is a goaltender who has been having an unbelievable year at the Russian second division. Um, and his season ended. Uh, I'll just run through this. The, look at listen to this. So they got eliminated. Uh, SKA's second division team got eliminated. Um, And here are his uh, save percentages by game. 30, he's in the, in the series where they got eliminated. Game one went to overtime uh, and and the second overtime and he stopped 80 of 84. Second game, uh, they lost 6-2. He saved 36 of 40. So still managed to 900. The next game, they lost 4-2. He faced 37 shots. Last game, he played, I believe, three and a half periods of overtime, 125 shots, 124 saves, and they lost one nothing and got eliminated. Three and a half periods of overtime? Yeah, the goal came at 158 minutes and 11 seconds into the game. Well, he couldn't be clutch enough for more than three games, Will, or more than two more, games. Yeah, so. more than two, two and a half games, basically. Um, but again... 510 goaltending is difficult to sell. That's that, there's one. There is one in the NHL. He's fine. And it's UC songs. Yeah. Right. Like 510, 160 pounds in net. It's a tough goaltending is a game of inches. And a lot of it is how strong can you be at keeping pucks out when there's six foot five men slapping pucks in your pads all night long? It's just a very different world. Uh, so. I'll believe it when I see it, but I also have not seen a tremendous amount of this guy, but you're right. He has had, I mean, he had a 950 save percentage last year in the MHL and a goals against average of two. So he was facing like 38 shots a night or so, if I'm doing my math right, 40 shots a night, not bad. Uh, thoughts on Mikhail Ilyin? He's fine. I still like Mukhanov more. Um, I do not believe that Ruslan, that, that name is real. I, I don't trust you either. Uh, <laughs> sh- should there be a, you need to be this tall to go on this ride rule in the NHL? Y- yes. At this point, you may as well, uh, oh, Mikhail. Also good to see you. Hello. Then there'd be no Logan Stankoven. Come on, man. <laughs> nah, man, we got to turn into hockey people, hockey men. No, um, but that's going to, that, that, that'll be it for tonight. Uh, I think that's enough. Uh, I think that'll be enough uh, questions for the evening. Um, evening, it's four in the afternoon. What am I talking about? I'm I'm used to night shows, uh, yeah, but Will, anyway. Will's, uh, ending, or, Will's ending right around four twenty to have a good break. Yes. That is yeah. Exactly. Is. Yeah. Having a just a just a. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I mean, before we go, did you want to run through your leaderboard just before we leave, oh, or do you want to save it for Monday? Because I see that you filled it out. Oh, my updated. 
I mean, it's not, it's not fully updated yet, to be okay, fair. Okay, then we'll do it. We'll do it later. We'll update but it on I'll, Monday. I'll, be, I'll go through the top five. All right, all right, so, do that. Celebrini, Demidov, Catton, Lindstrom, Frey. So far, the top five. Well, that's what I have name by name. Really? So, <laughs> not bad. Yeah. Yeah, of literally what is. I have. I'm that all, is my I'm top five. I'm always copying your lists, aren't I? Yep. Exactly. For sure. Well, that'll be it uh, today. Thank you very much for joining us again. We'll just run our quick ads before we leave. Uh, we're brought to you by Fanatics. You can use our affiliate link below where you can scan the QR code in the chat win or in the stream window to provide a kickback to the show and everything you buy in the store. We're also brought to you by Puck Preps Hockey, where you can get all your NCAA and CHL prospect needs. Again, uh, there are those drafts are coming up. Uh, especially the OHL draft lottery having just happened. The OHL cup is ongoing here in Toronto. So that'll, that's fun as well. Um, you can also support us through uh, puck preps or puck preps through fractal hockey consulting, which is my business for hand track targeted player analysis and recruitment packages uh, for the NCAA Europe and beyond with solutions for any organization's needs. And of course, scouting.ca where you can subscribe for exclusive access to innovative data tools with tons of insight into draft prospects and players making their way into the NHL. Uh, there's definitely uh, my updated draft rankings are also coming uh, between uh, hopefully next week for subscribers. So if you want to get those early, you can check that out there. So that is it for today. Uh, AJ, thank you so much. Job. Again, of course. Yep. Job. Uh, we will see you on another time. That time being Monday night at 8 PM. And mm -hmm. again, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yeah. All the best and toodles. Go Leafs go.